I may say it a second time as as more people come in, but uh, today we'll be using the the Mantra Babileo. You can see that that text channel just above the class chambro. We'll be using that space uh, for you guys to uh, be able to communicate amongst yourselves and to me uh, during the class. <clears throat> Let's see, let me give you guys the ability to send messages there now. Okay, it is open. De Mancha Babileo, you guys can write there now. Uh, you can say your hellos or whatever you want to do, but uh, this is where we're going to write. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can write them down uh, at any time in here. Although I will get around to those questions during the intermission and at the end of class. So we have a 10 minute break planned in the middle. And I'll let you guys know when that is. And although I'll probably take two of those minutes uh, as well, um, uh, you know, when I come back for anybody that's that's still here during the break, I'll be I'll be doing question and answer. Hmm. And other than that, there will be a couple opportunities for you guys to participate one way or another. So I I, I might tell you guys. Um, if you want to put in your responses in the in the text channel to a given question, you're welcome to do that. And on a couple of occasions, I might also ask for volunteers. And I'll, I'll tell you guys when that is, and you can put down in the text channel whether you'd like to volunteer or not, and kind of raise your hand, and I will unmute you for a, a cup for a minute or so to do this and that exercise. And it could be something like, you know, try to pronounce this word or guess what the corresponding English word is. I mean, nobody has to participate. It's okay if you don't want to, but that option is being made available. And if we don't have enough volunteers, I'll just proceed. Okay, looking good. I'll give it about one more minute, see if anybody's coming in after the fact, that's totally okay. Hmm. <clears throat> Suppose I could start introducing myself and then maybe maybe people will, uh, last few people will come in as I'm introducing myself, but it, it is the top of the hour now. Good morning or afternoon or whatever time it is for you guys. Folks, my name is Code Weaver. You can call me Code, you can call me CW, you can call me whatever you want really. And I'll be your instructor today. <clears throat> I'm one of the admins here at the Discord server. I've uh, been an admin here since about November 2020. I picked up Esperanto in about February 2020. So it's, it's about 17 months of Esperanto for me. Uh, I and I've been studying it very hard, right? That's a that's a pretty short time as far as um, as far as language learning goes. Uh, now I do want to stress to you guys today. Uh, awesome, there are people still coming in. Okay, good. I was almost getting worried there. I do want to stress to you guys. Uh, this class is meant to take two and a half hours. Now we went over a little bit on Friday. We didn't go over on Saturday per se, but I did have to cut out a, a couple lessons that, that would have been um, fun, maybe. But we got to the important parts, and that's about what I'm expecting for today. Um, but I will let you guys know when we hit the two and a half hour mark, and anybody that has places to go, I totally understand. That's not going to hurt my feelings. I said two and a half hours, and you have to, if you have to go then, that's totally fine. Uh, however, after class, I will still be around if anybody has any questions or if there's any uh, parts of the lesson that we didn't quite get to. And if you're not in a rush to go and you want to still do those, that's totally fine. But even with two and a half hours, I just want to uh, set the expectation. That's actually not a lot of time, especially for language learning. You know, uh, It takes an estimated... 150 hours of study to become conversational in Esperanto, and it takes about 400 to 600 hours to be conversational in some adjacent natural language. So if any of you here tonight, today, uh, are native English speakers, <clears throat> you know, Spanish, maybe, French, this would all take about as many hours, but Esperanto would take significantly less at 150, and that's still a lot of time compared to this class. Today... I am here to, th th this is a Kickstarter, if you will. Not for funding, but to <laughs> kickstart your Esperanto uh, journeys and careers. And I'm here to introduce you to the 
basic grammatical concepts, and especially some of the of the tricky bits that uh, that would usually stump beginners. As for the vocabulary and for and for words and things, that is. Th in my opinion, the hardest part, but that's the part that's always going to be with you. you know, even in your native language, you're still learning words over time. Uh, and, and definitely the same can be said in Esperanto. So we're not actually going to spend much time going over tables of words and, and, and memorizing them. We're going to mostly stick to the grammar today. Uh, and then I'm going to give you guys some resources at the end of class that may help you moving forward. Well, let's see. All right, T. Last but not least, I'm going to put the chalkboard up now. Uh, that's just what I like to call my notepad. Yes, there is this visual element here. I'm not going to have anything to write uh, for a little bit as I begin. But uh, if you join the, the stream that I just opened up, I'll be writing parts down as I say them. Uh, and I may be reading aloud parts that I write down, but you want to make sure that you can see that. Ah. All right. Without further ado, I think it's time to get into it. We're actually going to ease into it, uh, first of all. We uh, have plenty of time to get into the intro of the language itself, but I actually wanted to give you guys some background. Um, last but not least, I'd like to tell you guys with this, this chat, the Dimancha Babileo, uh, that we're using for question and answer, um, we're going to begin with an opportunity for you guys to respond in there. Um, why are you learning Esperanto? Uh, what do you know about Esperanto so far? Uh, this class was billed as, you know, from start to finish, or at least from the very start, I should say. So if there's any of you that have literally no background in Esperanto so far, you're in the right place. That's totally cool. But I'm still curious what you guys do already know about it. And, um, and we'll, we'll kind of go from there. We'll do a little history lesson first. You know, if, if the Duolingo owl coerced you to be here today, or if, if one of your friends just totally begged you to, to show up and learn Esperanto, that's fine, you know, write that down. That's totally understandable. <laughs> <clears throat> As for me, I was talking with one of my friends last year. Uh, he's taking a German class, and we were talking about the uh, all the words for the, you know, der, die, das, dem, des. Uh, and how you know, confusing that gets. Ah, you know how natural languages are. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, we should probably just learn Esperanto. I said, what? <laughs> what did you say? Espresso? That sounds like a very fun language. And the more I read about it, the less I could believe. And it just, it captivated me, right? So I, I, I had to get into it. Now that is awesome. I, uh, I I just read one of the responses here. My parents both speak Esperanto. I haven't met too many people that can say that. That's very neato. Um, let's see. So folks are bringing up a lot of good parts, uh, a lot of good points. Yes, the biggest thing about Esperanto, if you made it this far without knowing, now you know. It is a constructed language. That's a polite way for saying it's made up. <laughs> And, uh, and, I, and I like to own it, you know, it's made up, and that's okay, it's okay to say that. Um, not pejoratively, of course, but uh, that's one of the things that makes Esperanto so cool. It wasn't immediately obvious to me that you could do such a thing, that you could make a language, right? Especially one that is spoken by possibly millions of people throughout history. That just blows my mind. So Esperanto is a constructed language. It's the most spoken constructed language. Uh, now, constructed languages can encompass a lot of different uh, categories. You have your fictional languages for things like Star Trek. You, know, you have Klingon and High Valyrian and Dothraki. Those were made uh, constructed languages for Game of Thrones. Uh, Esperanto is, 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 of course, of a different variety. It was created in 1887 by a man named Dr. Zamenhof. Now, Zamenhof was a Polish-Jewish optometrist, that's uh, an eye doctor if I'm not mistaken, and a polyglot. The man spoke like eight languages all pretty well. He spoke Yiddish and Polish uh, natively. 
He, sp he spoke Russian, uh, Belarusian, and German about as well. Uh, and, and he was instructed French and German from his father, who taught those at university. He went on in uh, college to study Latin and Greek and Hebrew, and later in life studied Italian and English and uh, Lithuanian, I believe. So he was a pretty good candidate for making a language. He had a lot of experience to draw from. Now, I would be remiss to not point out these are all Indo-European languages, specifically a bit of Romance, a bit of Germanic, and a bit of Slavic. Uh, now I'd like to say, uh, I believe Esperanto has some features that are familiar or e uh, easy enough for uh, Asiatic speakers, you know, for example, Japanese, Chinese, but that would be more of a coincidence. Um, it's, it's, it's fair to say that Zamenhof's pool that he drew from was uh, European in nature. You, know, you can only learn so many languages that happen to be around you. But at this time, in the 19th century in Europe, Zamenhof grew up in, in, a, in a rather contentious part of Europe, you know, right between uh, the, the Poles, the Jews, the Russians, the Germans, and, the, and they didn't get along with each other at that time and at that place. You know, there was a, there was a bit of infighting. And it, Zamenhof belonging to several of these groups and being able to communicate between all of them, that just sounded weird to him, right? It, 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 it was a real head-scratcher. So he wanted to solve this problem, this human problem of not getting along. And uh, by college age, he had decided that it was a communication barrier problem, you know, and that it could be resolved by the introduction of a neutral auxiliary language. He tried, uh, he explored Latin at first. He thought maybe Latin would be uh, appropriate, uh, having been a former lingua franca. French was the lingua franca at this time. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a national language. You know, that's not really sufficient. He thought maybe Latin would do it. He decided it was too difficult for the for the layperson and i will believe him i'll believe the man who spoke eight or so languages when they say that latin was hard uh so he decided none are sufficient we've got to make our own and thus esperanto was born he worked on it for many years uh, you know 10 15 give or take and he made the first publication in 1887 with the unua libro which means first book now, of course, it wasn't titled Unua Libro. It was, uh, that's what we call it today, looking back. Uh, it was titled more something along the lines of Dr. Esperanto's Design for an International Language. Something along those lines. Uh, so any Frankenstein fans or readers out there might appreciate this joke. Esperanto is the name of the doctor. All right, so the language, therefore, is Esperanto's monster. <laughs> I promise you, everybody just burst out into laughter and, and applause. I know you couldn't hear it from each other, but I promise. <laughs> mm. Anyway, but that is true. That is the origin of the name Esperanto. The language didn't really have a name at first, uh, but it, it became known under this moniker, this pseudonym under which Zamenhof published the language at first. Esperanto itself means something in Esperanto. It means uh, one who hopes. I like to translate the name as you know, maybe Dr. Hopeful. Grammatically, it's not exactly the same. but And we will examine in a little bit where you get uh, one who hopes out of Esperanto. But in due time. So the Unua Libro. There's not much to cover in the Unua Libro because it is a design of the language and we're talking about the language today, right? So that's that's <laughs> pretty much is all the content right there. But there's two things that stand out about the Unua Libro. Number one, the very first thing Zamenhof did with his brand new language, hadn't even been named yet, is he renounced all rights to it and immediately put it in the public domain. I have to say that's very good leadership, in my opinion. I think that that was a key step in providing Esperanto with the community and with the freedom that it needed to grow. 
And secondly, at the back of the book, at the back of the Unua Libro, there was the Universal Vote, which was essentially a postcard, uh, and it had written on it in Esperanto something along the lines of, I, the undersigned, do pledge to learn this proposed international language if it would be that 10 million other people make the same pledge. You're supposed to sign that and mail it in back to Zamenhof. Uh, now, he, he sought 10 million and he got back about 1,000. So, pretty close. You know, almost there. 0.01% uh, of, of what he was shooting for. You know, that's not bad. No. <laughs> the reception to this international language was definitely mixed. But among the sea of criticism, Zamenhof did receive hundreds of letters uh, by also ardent fans of his design and of his proposal. So they kept going. Him and these thousand or so, it was probably a couple thousand, um, maybe some got lost in the post, but these early adopters, they were not deterred. They pushed forward, and over the next uh, 20, 30 years, they continued to translate works and to work out the kinks in the language and and make concrete the design and that all culminated in 1905 in Boulogne. I had to check the spelling on that, I'm so sorry. Obviously the French city of Boulogne. This was where the first World Congress of Esperanto was held. This was the when and the where. And it was here that Zamenhof delivered his Declaration of Boulogne, as we know it now. It was the first all-Esperanto meetup. I mean, you know, perhaps friends uh, would get together for a time and speak only Esperanto, but this had uh, uh, over a hundred attendees. They all met here in France, and they were all speaking Esperanto the whole time, right? And Zamenhof delivered his Declaration here, which... I'm not going to uh, paste these onto the chalkboard because it's quite a bit of words, but I am going to read for you this declaration because I actually think it's a very important part of the you know, basis of Esperanto because there's a lot of misinformation about what Esperanto is and what Esperanto is not. And this declaration is what Esperantism is. Number one, Esperantism is a movement that supports the introduction of an international auxiliary language. No further meaning can be attached to it. It is politically, religiously, and morally neutral, and it does not seek to replace any existing languages only to supplement them. So it's supposed to be a second language for everybody, right? Number two, it recognizes that Esperanto is the most realistic international auxiliary language that exists, and they work to further it based on this goal. Number three, Esperanto belongs to no one. Anyone can use it for any reason they like. Kind of following his uh, work in the Unua Libro, renouncing his own rights to the language. Nobody can lay claim to it. Number four, an Esperantist is a fluent Esperanto speaker. Involvement in the Esperanto community is encouraged but not required. Last but not least, the Fundamento de Esperanto is the single, perpetual, obligatory authority over Esperanto, and it cannot be modified. Beyond that, Esperanto depends on no legal authority, neither a governing body nor an individual, not even Zamenhof himself. If a linguistic matter is not covered in the Fundamento, it is up to the individual on how to handle the matter. Now, guys, you'll often hear people refer to the 16 rules of Esperanto. See, the fundamento is, if you will, the constitution of Esperanto. Uh, Zamenhof published it shortly before this meetup in 1905. And uh, to this day, it is uh, what that means, first of all. Fundamento de Esperanto is foundation of Esperanto, and this is uh, the core rule set. Famously, the grammar section, written in French, German, English, Polish, Russian, is the alphabet, and then it's 16 rules. It wouldn't be fair to say that there's only 16 rules. I mean, that's, that's nearly preposterous, but these are the most core rules. These are the rules from which all other rules follow. 
you know, and from there, it's all about establishing norms uh, that, that we all have between us as humans on Earth, the different languages we speak, uh, to be most comprehensible to one another. You know, so it's not fair to say that there are only 16 rules, but I prefer to say those are the 16 rules that must be adhered to. Beyond that, you can handle a matter however you will, but most people look to uh, modern resources that we have available today uh, as a basis you know, to help in intercomprehensibility. Now, modern resources, what do I mean by that? Well, there's the Plena Illustrita Vortaro, the complete illustrated dictionary of Esperanto. It's written only in Esperanto, but uh, that's considered by most to be the most authoritative dictionary we have to this day. There's the uh, PMEG, the Plena Man Libro de Gramatica Esperanto, the complete handbook of Esperanto grammar. Uh, and there's considerably more rules in there than 16. <laughs> but those are more of a guideline. Those are more descriptive of what Esperanto has evolved into through use. You know. Other contents of the Fundamento include the foreword written in Esperanto. Uh, there's the grammar section, as I said. There's an exercise book, pretty much. There's about 40 exercises to help one practice the language. And there is the Universala Vortaro. There's the Universal Dictionary at the back of the book. It is about 900 or so roots and pieces of words translated again between those same five languages, French, German, English, uh, Polish, and Russian. And that was where we began. The only other thing to this day uh, is the Academio de Esperanto. Uh, Zamenhof provisioned for a language academy whose job it is to see through the evolution of the language. It's not really their job to make decisions for us, but rather we use the language and they clarify matters of grammar and they add new words, you know, as are popularized in the Esperanto community. So we started with about 900 root words. Uh, today we have a little under 3,000 still, which is actually or excuse me, a little under 5,000. That's still very few for, for a language. I think the French language has, you know, some 100,000 words. Uh, English has arguably upwards of a million. It depends on what you count a word. There are certainly more words used in Esperanto as well, but these are, you know, unofficial words, neologisms, uh, loan words, things like that. But the Academio has officialized another, you know, 4,000 or so. But that is the history, folks. That is the, a little bit of background into Esperanto. Um, to this day, about 65,000 people, that's a conservative estimate, speak the language, or a more liberal estimate would be around uh, 2 million. And we're, it's growing every day. If we count just learners and not necessarily fluent speakers, we may be alive to see that 10 million marker. You all may be alive and you all may be a part of that tremendous occasion in Esperanto history. So thanks again, by the way, for everybody being here today and, and taking that step into Esperanto. I know for some of you, this is your, your first real step into it, and I appreciate you being here today. Without further ado, let's get into the language. We're going to start with the orthography. That is the... The writing system, the alphabet, how to pronounce it. And folks, you're in luck because this is a very regular part. You know, this is, it's always daunting because you learn the alphabet when you're a baby for, for your uh, for your native language, assuming that you, you have an alphabet um, or a syllabary or what have you. And then when you pick up another language and you have to learn it all over again, and not only do you learn the letters, but you learn all the different sounds they can make and the names. You know, they have separate names. Not as bad on Esperanto, not as complicated. Uh, first of all, the alphabet is based on the Latin alphabet. English's alphabet is as well, so most of the letters are uh, familiar. But we don't use Q, W, X, or Y. You know, those letters are just absent from Esperanto. And instead, we add six letters, which is really just taking six existing letters and adding a, a diacritic to them. So, those would be cho, jo, ho, jo, sho, and wo. 
and I'll go over those sounds again in a moment, but you can see these are the extra letters that are added by Esperanto. Uh, it's just these letters with hats. You can call them hats, but the, the correct term, or the official term would be circumflexes. It's the same that we have in uh, French over vowels, you know, like that. And then over here, this U with a bowl on it. You can call it a bowl, but officially it's called a breve. I don't expect you to remember that. Hats and bowls are just fine. That's what we call them. <laughs> now, you might be wondering why. Uh, first of all, wh why? Why th this kind of writing system? There's basically two. It comes down to two reasons. Uh, one, we seek to give every letter its own sound. Uh, and, and this allows us to have a couple more sounds that... Uh, that maybe we wouldn't want to do without. Uh, but why specifically this solution? Well, Zamenhof wanted something neutral, something that didn't exist in another language already, but still looked familiar enough. So circumflexes are very common uh, throughout Europe, but they've never been used in a natural language for these letters specifically, um, to give an example. And at the time, we were mostly still handwriting, so it, it, it made sense enough. And typewriters were kind of a new thing, but for typewriters, you could just write the letter C and then take it back a character and put on the caret or the circumflex. You know, most typewriters were able to do that. Oh, I see somebody is being uh, testy in chat. Removed. Thank you guys for pointing that out. i so sorry about that. It may take me a moment to see what's going on in the chat, of course, because I have all these windows over me. But anyway, uh, so it wasn't too terribly bad these, writing these letters at the time. Now, with the advent of computers, it is a little bit more cumbersome, but there is a way. You know, there's a way on any system to get an Esperanto keyboard. Uh, you know, no trouble. Uh, let's see... But in case you are unable to write these, uh, the, the hat letters, Zamenhof did foresee potential problems with that and offered a solution. Uh, the solution is called the, the H system. So let me write these out really quick. I'm going to do kind of a staggered view here. But uh, you would write all of the corresponding hat letters followed by an H. And this breve letter here, you'd actually just remove the breve, uh, you know. And, and th that will make sense in time. I'll show you why that's not so confusing. But it is still inconsistent, all right? And that's unfortunate. Uh, you know, uh, this letter, cho, makes the ch sound that we're familiar with. So that's, uh, you know, that makes sense. You know, if, if you had to abandon the official writing system and use the h system, uh, that's not so bad on the eyes. Uh, GH isn't so bad. SH is very natural. But, you know, then we get into JH. We get into, okay, we have a double H there. We don't have an H at all here. Some people were upset with that solution. So in the modern day, we also have available the X system. So, and that one's a little bit more... Uh, whoops, a little bit more regular. It's just an X after everything. Now, it's up to you whether that looks any better or worse, but, you know, at least we don't leave off you with a brief. Whoa. Uh, and X isn't already a letter in Esperanto. So if you ever see an X in Esperanto writing, you can be sure you're just looking at these same letters with the X system. Hmm. Well, let's look at the alphabet. The names of the letters are just the sounds that they make, uh, consonants being followed by the vowel O. So I'm just going to read you the names of the letters, and uh, I'll stop and go over the pronunciation of any tricky ones. Uh, Esperanto has a five-vowel system. It's the same vowels, roughly, as Spanish, Italian, Japanese. Uh, so they should be pretty familiar, but without further ado. A, Bo, Tso. So that's like... TS. Uh, that's going to take some getting used to. You know, we have that sound in English, but we, d we don't give it its own letter or, or its own uh, digraph or anything. But if that's confusing, uh, just remember that we have the letter X, which is uh, KS. Uh, XO. Right? So it's in a similar vein as that. XO. Take some getting used to. Just remember that it's not S and it's not K, like, a, like the letter C could be in, in English. A, BO, XO, CHO. Whoops. Cho, uh, so that's like ch, and as you can see above, it could literally be ch uh, given the circumstances. Cho, do, e, fo, go, jo. Uh, 
So in English, G could be hard or soft. Uh, a hard G would be like garden. A soft G would be like gem, gemstone, Gemini. And here, those are two different letters. Uh, but you could see the, the Joel, you know, G with a hat. Uh, same place of articulation, roughly, as uh, C with a hat. You know, so that's, that's e easier to remember over time. It helps. Ho. Ho. That, one, that one's difficult. M most dialects of English don't have that sound. <clears throat> Shorten this a little bit. Uh, they don't have that sound. Um, but the closest thing is in Scottish English. Loch Ness Monster. Now that's the right sound. Uh, or to say the name of the composer Bach. Now, a lot of people just say Bach with a hard K. Um, so I even then, you know, not everybody's in the practice, but that's what sound that is. Now, if that is difficult for you to pronounce, don't worry. It is also the least common letter in the language. It appears very infrequently, and some people are even trying to reform it away entirely uh, over my dead body. <laughs> but, uh, oh. Let's see. E. Remember the vowels are different here than in English, but E. Yo, jo. So this will be a little bit confusing to just native English speakers. Uh, yo here. This is pretty much like the letter Y. Uh, well, it's, it works exactly that way. Yo. Uh, and, and it's also this way in German, for example. Uh, and also in several Slavic languages, they use this this letter J like a, a glided E. And it makes sense. Uh, it's easier to see when it's lowercase, but uh, if you put the letters side by side, J is just I with a tail, is it not? Uh, in fact, we didn't used to have these two separate letters in history. They kind of just uh, broke apart into these two. So, although this is strange to English speakers, it's strange to French speakers, strange to Spanish speakers, there is some sense for it. E, yo, or you, at the end of a syllable, uh, oi, right? And then jo. That's similar to what we expect in English, it's similar to jo, however, it's not exactly the same sound. Uh, it's like in measure, or genre, it's that softer, anyway. And then we have a couple letters that are just as you would expect. Ko, mo, no, oh, whoops. Ko, lo, mo, no, o, po. There's no Q, as I said, but the name of that letter would be ko, and then that would be vavo, ixo, ypsilono, if talking about another alphabet. Uh, but we just uh, skip straight to ro. Now, here's the thing about ro. Um, Zamenhof says you can pronounce it however you want. You know, the... The fundamento says that you can pronounce R as you would uh, usually, maybe in your native language. Uh, <laughs> R can be quite different between languages, so you can use the uh, you know American R or um, you know the British R or uh, my my teaching assistant who was here the previous two days does a much better French R than I do, but like oh. Something like that. Uh, tap R, ro, ro, ro. My advice to you guys is just to practice using the tap R, ro, ro, or the trill R, ro. Uh, the thing about the trill is that's really hard. That takes a lot of practice. I've been practicing it this whole time. Um, but it is a lot clearer. You know, so that's you got that going for you. But sometimes the tap R is just easier to say. Those are both uh, pretty acceptable. If you pronounce it any other way, that's okay. Uh, but it certainly accents you. Uh, so it's something to, to strive towards. Uh, so, sho, to, u, wo, vo, zo. This works a lot like the letter W, and you might be asking, why don't we just have the letter W? And it's because that letter is only meant to appear in the diphthongs AU and EL. Uh, for example, Europo, right? Europe. Or uh, Automata, right? So, and you can see how etymologically uh, we, we would expect a U there and not like a W. So it's more of a stylistic decision, if anything. But, so there's the alphabet. Now, guys, who would like to uh, volunteer, right? I'm going to set out a couple words at a time, and I would like to see you guys, uh, if you want, try and pronounce them. 
Uh, I'll, I'll let people write in the chat for a moment if they would like to volunteer. I will go first come, first serve, except for Sebi because he's been here the entire weekend and has volunteered a lot. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm, though. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll also give you what the words mean. I don't expect you to remember them, but these words may appear later in the class as well. So, Before I uh, take volunteers up here, the last thing I'm going to say is uh, the stress patterns. So let me take this word Adamo, right? Uh, that would be a proper name. It's like Adam. But uh, the stress always follows uh, falls on the second to last syllable of the word. So in English, we'd say Adam and the stress is on the A. Well, in that case, we only have two syllables, so that's fair. But uh, you have to be watching out for the syllables present in, in Esperanto because that may lead a word to be pronounced differently than you would expect. So, Adamo, that's the second to last there. Um, laboratorio, right? The sec second to last syllable is there. And every vowel gets its own syllable, no exceptions. So, you know, even though we have this EO here, those are two separate syllables, and therefore E gets the emphasis there. Now, guys, it's not that big of a deal. In, we, in, in English, you would say laboratory. So if you say laboratorio, uh, or, or if you totally stumble over it, you know, that's fine. You know, that's, you know, no one will be confused, per se. Uh, but the reason that stress even matters at all is because there is a thing you can do where you can take off the last syllable in a word for for poetic reasons or, or what have you. You wouldn't do it as often in everyday speaking, but there is a rule that allows you to do that to save a syllable, and, and keeping the stress in the proper place helps you differentiate between words. There's two different words, uh, chiello and chiel. And if I were to do that technique and remove the O here, this would still be chiel. You know, and, and then, therefore it would be clear that I'm saying uh, Chiello and not Chiel, right? So that's why those rules exist. But don't sweat it too much. But okay, I'm going to start taking up volunteers now. I'm going to start writing these words first of all. Okay, there's your first five words for the first person I call up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you who I'm calling up, I'll unmute you, and then you'll also have to unmute yourself. You know, Discord muted you guys coming in here. I can allow you to unmute yourself, but I can't unmute you for you because that would be a huge violation of privacy. So don't forget uh, to unmute yourselves as well. So let me look down the list here. Okay, Sammy. Sami, Sami, you're going first. You are able to unmute yourself now. And let's see if you can pronounce these five words. Do the best you can. Okay. Pomo. Mm -hmm. Curi. Yep. Ruja. Yep. Uh, chocolado. Mm -hmm. Adiel. Very good. Perfect. Model. Absolutely stellar. I would think um, uh, native English speakers, and by the way, I understand a lot of you may not be. I understand some people here today may speak something else natively, you know, German, French, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and then also speak English. Uh, and that's fine too. That will actually help you guys a lot uh, in ways that I will get into more later. So I don't know how the sp uh, stress patterns work in your guys' languages other than the ones in Esperanto were modeled after Italian. But in English, uh, I think a lot of people might tend to emphasize the adiel. So, you know, that's something to look out for. Wo is, is a consonant, of course, so that's one syllable. Adiel. Anyway, but very good. You did absolutely right. Okay. I'll call up the next, per I'll write the next words and call up the next person. Uh, these words, by the way, are apple. Pomo is apple. Curi is to run. Ruja is red. Chocolado is chocolate, and adiao is farewell, uh, particularly for a long time farewell. Okay, next words. These are going to be fun. Okay. Aislin Ravende, I am going to unmute you, or now you are able to unmute yourself, and you can read these words next. You're up next. Hello. Horo. Hello. Yep. Horo. Very good. Horo. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, Nora. Perfect. That's absolutely perfect. You guys are good at this. I don't know. Maybe maybe a lot of you have had some exposure already. I heard the, the correct sound there. Joro, very good. And I also heard uh, the right stress here. And I heard these sounds. In English, uh, obviously this resembles the word honor. There's a couple words in English where it starts with H and we leave it off. Uh, and, and that would be like honora. But not an Esperanto. You, you'd make sure to pronounce that letter as Aislinn did. So very good. Thank you. Very, very good. Um, and then, okay, so you, uh, let's see. Mute you again for the moment. So that's, uh, Koro is heart, Koro is chorus, uh, Horo is hour, and Honora is uh, honorable. Uh, with an O, that would be honor, and we'll get more into that in a little bit. Next four words, and I'll look for someone else to call up. <clears throat> John Track, I'm about to unmute you. There you go. You're able to unmute yourself now. Are you ready? Birdo, biero, manjajo, manjeyo. Perfect. Flawless. You guys are good at this. Goodness gracious. Uh, native, especially here in the U.S., yeah, I'm American, of course, and, and if you showed an American this word for the first time, they might have a tendency to say birdo, because it's clearly the word for bird, and it is, um, uh, but very good uh, attention to the right sounds there. Birdo, biero, good emphasis there, good difference between uh, jo and jo, manjajo, manjeo, perfect. Uh, bird, beer, uh, food and uh, eating place that could be a cafeteria a dining room a restaurant what have you very good uh there is one more uh one more group here and then we'll move on is those words uh do we have any more volunteers if not i will just i'll read these myself and we can go on ahead I'll give it about five minutes. I'll sip this water here. You need a lot of water to speak for two and a half hours straight. Diakritoi. <laughs> hmm. All right. You are up. You are able to unmute yourself and give these four words a try. Shinas. Mm -hmm. Tatsu. Yep. Exerci. Axeli. Perfect. Beautiful. And you guys can tell uh, that, you know, clusters like this KZ, these would be X in, you know, Latin or whichever Romance language it came from. Uh, but sometimes it's KS, sometimes it's KZ, um, and you know, sometimes you have this KC or, you know, Kotzel. Uh, so sometimes it's easy to get tripped up on those, but you did flawlessly. Very good. All right. I won't have a volunteer for this last one, but I do have one last cluster here that I will point out. Uh, these are some of the hardest words to pronounce in the language, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm showing them here to show you how bad it can get. It doesn't get any worse than these, I promise. Um, let's see. But there are no exceptions, right? So you have to be attentive about these. Uh, this word means hero. By the way, I think I didn't say what the uh, previous words meant. Shainas is uh, seems, seeming. Patse is peacefully. Exerci is to exercise. Akseli is to accelerate. Sorry about that. He, uh, this is hero. You pronounce it hero. So even though that there are two of the same vowel next to each other, those are still meant to be separate syllables. Now, you could pronounce it hero o. And, and do like a pause, and that would be okay. You know, we're just trying our best. Um, I tend not to do that, but what I do make sure to do is, is put the stress in the right place. Head O, that second, uh, or that, that first O there would get it. Now, if you're, if you're wondering why words could come about that way, uh, we'll talk about word derivation in a minute. That's the next section, but uh, another form of this word would be heroa, meaning heroic. So that's more familiar in, in English to uh, hero, head all. Chiui, chiui, right? Mute my phone there. Uh, that means everyone uh, or everybody. 
And there's only those two syllables there, and that one comes first. Chi Ui. And then last but not least, Si. People love to make memes about this word. And, oh God, Zamenhof, why? Uh, frankly, Zamenhof was uh, acquainted with several languages that had uh, so so. Uh, one after the other, so I'm sure he didn't think much of it at the time. Not to mention that a lot of words from Latin and, and its descendants have that consonant cluster still. So I'm sure it made some sense at the time, even though it's kind of hard to pronounce, but you can get there. If you need a hint, ghosts. There's your STS sound, ghosts. We have that in English. It's not as crazy as it seems. That's at the end of a syllable, of course. Here it's at the beginning, so it takes some practice. C, E. But anyway, if you can pronounce C, you can pronounce anything. And guys, it's okay to glide over those syllables from time to time, and people will still understand you. There's no reason to you know, fuss about the little details. But there you have it. All right, that's the uh, orthography for you. Uh, if anybody is still very new to the alphabet in Esperanto and, and they don't feel like they quite got it, that's okay. There's going to be plenty more uh, Esperanto examples and things throughout this class, and I'll read each of them aloud so you can get a better feel for the pronunciation that way. But now it's time for us to talk about word derivation and specifically the part of speech endings. So the, one of the expressive features of Esperanto is how it handles word derivation. Uh, the idea that in a, nat in a natural language you may have closely related concepts that are totally different words, right? And that we will have examples today where that is the case in English and it's not the case in Esperanto. Esperanto seeks to tie as many concepts together as possible to the same uh, roots to help people learn and help people recognize those those words and commit them to memory right away. So I'm going to start out with uh, a question to you guys. Feel free to write your responses in the Dimancha Babileo. By the way, if anyone was wondering, Sunday chat room, if you didn't see it on the uh, description there. What do noun, adjective, verb, and adverb mean? What are the meanings of these words? There's going to be a couple grammar terms this class, uh, and I don't expect you to memorize or remember all of them. I'm just using them for description's sake. But those four words you absolutely should remember. Those are very important. Um, you may have covered them in school, but even if you did or didn't, or you do or don't remember, let's see what you guys do remember. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. While you guys write your responses, I'm going to write a couple things up here. The idea that Zamenhof had is uh, he, he was traveling abroad, and uh, he ended up speaking really good Russian, but at some time he was still getting used to it, I suppose, or or maybe he spoke spoke it well, but you know didn't know as many words. Uh, he was traveling abroad, and uh, he he saw a place. It was a butcher's. It might have been something else, but for example's sake, I remember it as being a butcher's. And uh, he knew exactly what it said, because it didn't say uh, butcher. I mean, there wasn't a separate word. It said something like meat cuttery or something like that. And, that, uh, and thus the idea in, in Esperanto was born that less is more. You know, the, the, the more we can put together fewer words, the better learners can understand, hopefully. So, okay, folks have had a chance to write in the chat, and you're all right. Uh, let's see. Noun is a person, place, or thing. Doesn't have to be a concrete thing. You know, it could be abstract, it can be uh, an idea, or what have you, but those are all nouns. Adjective describes a noun. A verb is an action of some kind. <laughs> I almost spelled a diction there. An action. And an adverb describes a verb or an adjective. So folks, adverb is kind of this catch-all term, uh, especially among European languages. Adverbs can do a lot and of work and pull a lot of weight. So uh, adverbs can also describe adjectives in a way that's very familiar in English and uh, most European languages. So, you know, the really big house, right? House is a noun, that's a thing. Big is an adjective that's describing the house, really is an adverb. 
Uh, and an adverb, you know, could be, you know, you, we usually use it to describe a, a verb. Uh, for example, misidas uh, heime. Uh, well, well, I'll tell you guys about the endings here in a minute. But I'm sitting, I'm sitting home. I'm staying home. Right, home there is we're using it like an adverb, right, and that's it's that's where we're sitting or that's where we're staying. Here it's modifying big, and that makes sense too. It's you, you can use some intuition there, but all of these uh, parts of speech correspond to these word endings here. So all nouns end in an o. All adjectives end in an a. All verbs end in uh, one of, of these uh, six endings here, uh, chiefly e. That's the infinitive ending. We'll talk more about that when we have a chance. And then e is your adverbs. Now, there are plenty of words that don't fit into this paradigm. You know, there are plenty of words that don't take an ending or they don't have to have an ending. For example, prepositions. There's lots of prepositions, and that's its own part of speech, you know, so it doesn't take uh, an ending. You know, for example, uh, you know, sub, you know, under, right? You could just not have an ending on it, but you could put an ending on it if you wanted. So, uh, suba, if we make it an adjective, that's uh, we're describing something that is under or is underneath, you know, the, the under this and that. Uh, the, the chat room today, the dimancha babileo. Dimancho is the word for Sunday. So that's a noun, and it, and it typically is followed by an o, and then, then you'd know it's a noun, but we can change that part of speech ending to a, and suddenly we have an adjective. And in, in, in English, that's a case where we don't even change the form of the word, and, and therefore that could be uh, uh, confusing what that would be. But, you know, the Sunday chat room, the di mancha babileo. Babileo is a good one, too. So uh, just as much as there's a uh, part of speech endings, and I'll get to the, the verb endings here in a moment. I don't mean to overlook those, but uh, it's not just part of speech endings. Esperanto goes further, right? There's also a lot of affixes at our disposal and also we have a tendency to combine a lot of words so you know less is more we have a lot of smaller pieces to build bigger pieces with so uh let's see babileo i'm gonna start using this notation for this section where i put apostrophes between the different parts so you can see where they divide uh babili is uh, to chat so if we take off that e ending and add this a suffix, that is the suffix for a place or a location. So suddenly we have a place for chatting, right? Uh, and a is a very regular uh, suffix as well. You know, for example, manji is to eat. So manjeo is a place for eating. That's one of the words that appeared. Uh, earlier in the pronunciation section. And uh, kuiri is to cook, so uh, kuireyo could be a word for kitchen, right? Or, or at least a, a place where you're cooking. This can be extended very vastly, and there's a lot more than just a. Now, I don't have a full list for you guys because there's dozens of them. There's dozens of suffixes. Mm. It can be used in this way, and that's part of your journey is to, is to go find them out and find out all the cool things you can do the, with them. But we will go over a couple examples here. Uh, let's see. So if E is a, a verb ending among these ones to choose from, and I tell you guys that manji is to eat, you can respond in chat, what... Do you think manjo means? We have taken manji, which is to eat, and we've turned it into a noun, manjo. What do you guys think that means? I'll give you about, you know, eight, eight seconds. Good catch. I'm seeing very good responses. <laughs> very good responses. This could be translated to meal. Meal would, would be the, the best word to use in English, uh, but a more literal translation would be, you know, an eat. <laughs> now that doesn't sound right in, in English, of course, so I'll give you another example that does. But the point to illustrate here is that 
we do have to respect the inherent part of speech of a given root. You know, so that's that's something that, you know, lamentably we couldn't really avoid with Esperanto, but it's still easier than you think. Manji is to eat. So manjo, you know, manj has something to do with eating. Uh, we started with a verb. That's inherently a verb. So this this would be an instance of eating. Another example would be kuri is to run. That was another example word from earlier. So kuro would be like a run. Let's go for a run today, right? You know that makes sense. But we can apply that more regularly in Esperanto than we can in English. Now an eat is is you know we have a separate word for that. It's meal, right? Now to get food though we still use the same root. We still do use the same root. We use the suffix aj, manjajo. Aj is uh, is a product or a you know something made from the root or something that has to do with the root, something concrete, uh, a thing basically. So that's basically a, a thing for eating. That is food. So notice, you know, if this is to eat, notice how many different words we have here in English. To eat, you know, food for a meal. I know those, are, those are totally unrelated words. Here in Esperanto, they all have the same root. Now, you may not have been able to guess the right ones right away. A lot of people guess food for manjo, and, and food would rather be manjajo. But now that you've been exposed to that, I suppose you'll never forget it. Next time you see the word manjajo, you're going to think, oh yeah, that's food, you know, the thing for eating, right? Even if you didn't know that, as long as you knew the suffix aj. So, very cool stuff going on there. Here's another example that isn't inherently a verb. Uh, bon, bona. Bon is the root for good. Therefore, uh, bona means, you know, good as an adjective. It's inherently an adjective. Whoops. Bonne. Now, to make... Adverbs in English is, is actually pretty regular. We have a couple exceptions. That's one of the more regular, more plausible things in um, in English. But we usually add ly in uh, in English. So you know, quick is a, is an adjective, and quickly is the adverb. Uh, but good is is one of the places where we actually have an exception in English. You know, bonne, goodly. Well, we don't say goodly, we say well. But here in Esperanto, a little bit simpler, right? And you can extend this all the way. Bono, making it a noun. That would be like, you know, for the good of mankind, right? For the good, right? The good. <clears throat> it's turning it into a, an abstract noun like that. But what about boni? Right? So if we turned it into a, a verb here, you look at that and you think that's too good, right? Well, you can think of it that way if you want to. We use it that way in Esperanto, or we can. But uh, when you take a adjective and uh, verbify that, you're, you're pretty much making a stative verb. It's like to be good. So that's another example of where it matters what the root inherently has to do with but we can absolutely make a verb out of that you know to be good you know me estas bona i am good versus me bonas i am good and that's just one of the cool cleverisms of uh, of esperanto let's see here making pretty great time actually another thing to uh point out manj a o so a here is a suffix, but suffixes can actually be used on their own. So an ayo is a place or a location, an ajo is a thing, right? Um, they can always be used on their own. So effectively, we have a couple pieces that were intended by Zamenhof to be suffixes. Uh, and in fact, they're pretty much their own words in their own right, which brings me to the next part, uh, combining words together. Combining full words works exactly the same as shown here. Uh, you can think of it as reading back to front. You know, just like in English, the head of a combined word goes at the back. You know, This is a place for eating. But let me give you a, a better example that translates to English. Songbird. Okay, it is a bird of song. It's it's not a song of bird. We read it back to front pretty much. It works the same in Esperanto. Canto birdo. Right? 
We even preserve the fact that that's a noun. I mean, the noun form is kind of a funny thing to use, in my opinion, because it's a bird that has a tendency to sing or likes to sing, you know, kind of emphasizing the action, you know, the verb. But we use the noun form there as we do in Esperanto. Uh, you can choose whether or not to le uh, include the O uh, between words. You know, usually you have to end the word in, in, in an O as the noun ending, but when combining, it's up to you. Uh, it's mostly down to pronunciation. Kantbirdo, I find that easy to pronounce, but I've seen Kantobirdo more often. I have to admit it's easier to pronounce, so mm. you can certainly do that. Let's see here. One thing I will point out, though, is I say it works exactly like in English, but there's one example, or excuse me, one exception that you're likely to run into, and that's uh, something like tag mezzo. That would be midday. But obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but the word for day is tag. The word for mid is mez. Mezzo. Uh, and that's because in English, we use mid like a prefix. In Esperanto, we use it like a proper, like, you know, that's its own word. You know, that means middle. Um, so sometimes the word, is, uh, the word order is opposite of what you would expect, and that's, that's English's fault. <laughs> right, Esperanto's perfect, right? <laughs> uh, that being said, how about this? Discord server. I'm going to give you guys like eight seconds. I don't want to take too long on it, but guess what part of speech... Make some room there. What part of speech is the word Discord here in, in this... Uh, part here, Discord server. Is that a noun or an adjective or a verb or an adverb? I'll give it a couple more seconds. Somebody had a good guess. Uh, uh, genitive. Um, the genitive, or in other words, uh, showing possession, would be uh, if we had an apostrophe S there, Discord's server. Uh, but no. Um, I see a lot of good guesses. You would think adjective, but no. Discord here is actually a noun. If it were truly an adjective, what we would have on our hands is Discordy server. <laughs> and, you know, that's not right. Uh, English has this overwhelming tendency to use what's known as a noun adjunct or a, or a noun complement. I saw one person put that, and that's right, a noun complement. And it's basically where we take a noun... And it is a noun by all accounts, but we use it as an adjective. You cannot do that in Esperanto. Uh, you can't describe one thing or one term with multiple different uh, O words. So you can't say discordo servilo. Those would be the words. And fun fact, il is another very regular uh, suffix there. That means tool or implement. Uh, so a tool for serving, server, there you go. Um, you wouldn't have that. So this is actually a really good candidate for combining words. I just wanted to illustrate that because it's never totally clear uh, when starting out, you know, when you should do adjectives, when you should do combined words. This is a good use case for combining the words instead. When you have multiple nouns to make one noun, uh, in English you may or may not have a space. Uh, you definitely uh, you definitely don't have one in Esperanto. When there's a proper noun involved, you could even put a hyphen. That's okay. You know that's you know if you must. Um, but there you have it. Let me make sure I'm gonna look over my notes. So I didn't forget anything. I wanted to talk about mal. There we go. Uh, we also have some prefixes, and I'm not gonna get too deep into the intricacies, except to tell you that mal exists. That is. Far and away the most popular, most common prefix that you're going to see because a lot of words are made from it. Uh, a specific kind of word is made from it. Mal is a prefix meaning opposite. So as I showed you earlier, bona is good, mal bona is bad. Ne bona would be not good. Not necessarily bad, but not good. So it's kind of middle of the road. So if it has a true opposite, Less words than you think actually do, but a lot of the most common words do. So, malbona is bad. Longa is long, and malonga is short. Um, 
granda is big and mal granda is small, right? So there's a lot of there's a whole class of words that are made this way. Uh, that that pretty much halves the number of, of of this class of word that you have to remember. So very good there. All right, the last part of this section is to cover these that I said I would cover, and then we are doing fantastic on time today. Uh, we're gonna go into the break. Uh, with actually some time to spare. Uh, we'll take an intermission. I'll let you guys know when, but I would be remiss to skip over what these mean. So I said that the verbs could end in any of these. So E is definitely the, the dictionary form of a word, right? So manji whoops, is to eat. That's what's called the infinitive. <clears throat> in English, the infinitive is almost always preceded by this word to. So that is a good indicator of when you use the infinitive. And it's a good indicator even translating to Esperanto. It's pretty one-to-one. -one. Um, but then there's these other endings here. So these are the, the ones that you'll probably be most comfortable with. Is is past tense, as is present tense, and os is future tense, right? So if manji is to eat, you know, I am eating or I eat would be me manjas. I ate in the past would be ma me manjis, and I'm going to eat or I will eat would be me manjos, right? Now what about those other two, us and u? Us is the conditional you can think of it as equivalent to the word would in English. Now, it's not equivalent, actually. It, rather, if you think of it that way, that's, that's a tool to help you. But you wouldn't strictly uh, translate it that way all the time. But if you're never sure what the meaning is supposed to be, then us, just remember would. Just remember conditional. Um, let's see. Mi ce estus la feston? Sergi uh, casus. Just to, to, to demonstrate an example where we wouldn't necessarily use the word would, I would attend the party if it were to happen. You could also say if it would happen. So you can never go wrong thinking of it that way, but you know, if you were ever to go all the way with Esperanto and end up doing professional translation, you have other options there. But uh, that's an example of, uh, of us. And then u, u will definitely take some getting used to. We're not gonna go over any exercises in here. That's, that's kind of an exercise for the reader, but u uh, is roughly equivalent to should. And in the same vein, you wouldn't always translate it as should, but you can always think of it that way. But that's for, uh, that's known as the volative. That also covers the imperative, if you're familiar with that word, imperative. But it means uh, it's for desires, it's for wishes, it's for commands, for orders. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, for example, vi manju tiun pomon. You should eat that apple. If I leave off the pronoun uh, that, that might have more of a command sense to it, eat that apple. Come on, eat it, right? Uh, but also, you could have ex constructions like uh, ni iru al la parco. We, uh, we should go to the park, or better explained as let's go to the park. Let us go to the park, right? So there's a couple different uses for ooh. All right, guys. Five minutes ahead. That's amazing. It is break time now. It is intermission time. Uh, before you go, though, uh, and, and take your break, I'll give you guys about 10 minutes. We'll come back here at... 16, not 15, I'll give uh, the, the clock just changed, I'll have it till 16, but uh, let's see, I wanted to introduce my teaching assistant, who is here now, who has joined at some point, so I'm going to step away for a minute, I'm going to use about two minutes, uh, you guys have a 10 minute break, feel free to get up, stretch, go get a drink, go get popcorn, use the restroom, do whatever, uh, I'll be back in two minutes, and um, uh, Maro Kuyo is here now. He can introduce himself. And we will take questions during this time if anybody has them uh, who is still here during the break. So see you guys in a moment. <clears throat> Hi there. I am Maro Kuyo. I am the teacher assistant that Kurt was talking about. 
Uh, so basically, um, I came in just a little late, had some of those stuff to do, but I'm glad I get to see this Sunday class. So, just explain my position real quick. Um, I won't be aiding in Code's teaching. He already has all that down. Um, what I am here for is, well, you've already seen me go into the chat. Um, I moderate the chat and answer any questions that you guys might have that you would like to ask Code. Um, and if he, because he's busy kind of, you know, teaching and everything, you guys would just simply ask me and I just uh, answer to the best of my ability. If you need any questions immediately answered or have something just of interest, just ping me and I'll be fine. Um, also, I'm pretty sure he went over just, uh, stuff that he'll do after class. Um, I will also be here after class. I have legit, like, nothing else to do. <laughs> so I will be here, and if Code needs to go over anything extra after class, then I will also be there too. I'll be taking questions um, that Code can't immediately attend to, and if you're just curious or anything like that, then yeah, uh, I'll be here. The volative in English, um, well, like just like how Code just explained, um, should it would say really good translation of that. Um, and uh, the command imperative as well. If you take out the pronoun in Esperanto, it turns into a little bit more of a command, like, um, manjo, that means eat. But if you say vi manjo, that means you should eat. Ni manjo, we should eat, that kind of thing. It's that, it's like, oh yeah, it should happen now, or do it. <laughs> Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, the we, English doesn't exactly have a grammatical vol uh, volativo. No, um, English has like um, it's not a grammatical thing really. With should or could, it's just kind of like auxiliary words that just have more of a, I guess, depend. How do you how do you word it in uh, those terms? Um, like in not importance, but like urge, urgingness, like what you feel that that person or some action should be doing, that kind of thing. That's really what English has got. Um, is there a difference for we should eat and let's eat? In it's like we can put devos instead of devils. But like, um, or devil, actually, no, yeah, um, in this case, yeah, with that dev, like, anything that isn't devos is always really weird in Esperanto, but like, in this case, yeah, that works. Yeah, so I just showed up, I just got back, um, to illustrate that kind of, devi is the word, uh, must, or ha to have to, to do something, uh, and we'll see that in a later example, um, yeah. If you put the conditional ending on Devi, you, you get a word that's kind of equivalent to should. But here's the thing. When you start out as a, as a beginner in Esperanto, you, you may feel more comfortable with this. And I'd like you guys to get more comfortable with this, because this is a little bit more common and a little bit more expressive. But these aren't necessarily... Neither of these are wrong. Uh, there's a bit of a nuance difference you know, we should eat versus let's eat. This is more let's eat, but this is also more common to say. Uh, but that's all I can think of, really. I mean, they both kind of mean each other. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, what is the difference between manju and ni manju? So if there's not a pronoun present uh, with the volative, with the u ending, it's it's understood to be to you, towards the second person. So manju is roughly equivalent to vi manju. Um, and I say roughly equivalent because, again, if you say none at all, that comes off more as a command. Um, but you're talking to the same person in that case. Ni manju is, uh, ni is the word for us, for we, you know, first person plural. So that's saying we should eat, you know, uh, let's eat, right? Let us eat. <clears throat> um, what is volative in English, for example? Can you think of any model? I already, I already answered. Um, yeah, that's what you were talking about when I got here. Yeah. yeah. 
what I heard, and, I, I uh, agreed with. There's not really one um, thing. I, I mean, well, you know, one example is 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 let's right, let, or you know, it's short for let us. You know, that's that's a volative expression in English. I uh, uh, so, sorry, it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna sing right now. This, <laughs> um, yeah, it's like way too early, and my nephews are in the other room. I don't want to wake them up. Oh, that's fine. I, I let them know yeah, that you had you... stuff going on this morning. Uh, yeah. Um, also, if uh, if you guys don't know what he's talking about, uh, I don't know what brought it up or the conversation that happened, but I uh, was pretty much, uh, I was bullied by the chat <laughs> to see on Monday. Uh, not Monday, geez. Uh, what is it? Friday session. Friday and session. I did it, so. <laughs> we, yeah, we might arrange that again if anyone wants a conlang uh, singing experiment. Yeah. <laughs> Sing less, yeah, battle. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, now that I think about it, I never posted the uh, thing there. Um, I think I should. Oh, I have to get a Google this. Docs and um, <laughs> organize a little bit. But yeah, it was like a, it was a song you translated. Yay! It's not not easy doing poetry if you want to do it right in Esperanto. Definitely. The whole class. The pro okay, so for anybody who is curious, um, Le Espero or La Espero is uh, one of the first poems written in the language, written by Zamenhof. Um, and it, it was, I think it appeared in the Unua Libro or the Dua Libro. It was, it was just a, a sample of, um, of the of the language of poetry in the language and and people have kind of taken it as a sort of uh, theme or or, or uh, you know uh, an anthem if you will but there's so many different takes on it too so yeah uh, I'm trying to find my poetry book actually I have no idea where I put that thing at I got my Codesto Matillo but I have no idea what the Esperanto poetry book is I actually don't know of any... Like, I know they're out there, but I haven't come upon a, a, a book that's just poetry yet, so I wouldn't know. Well, it's a bunch of translated works by... Um, oh, my goodness. I feel bad for forgetting the author's name. Um, was it Cabe or Claude Garon or Rosetti? I think, you know, I think it was Tolstoy himself. Oh, maybe. Oh, my goodness. It was one of the most, like, famous, like, uh, he's not golden age like I think he's one of the guys who were either started or before Russian golden age of literature <clears throat> oh my goodness please 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 I need to find it because I really enjoyed that book <laughs> well you can go looking for it we got a little under a minute until the break ends and uh, if you do end up finding it you know, feel free to post it uh, at the end when I post the links and everything as well. Uh, yeah, by the yeah. way, um, like I said, guys, I'll let you all know when we hit the two and a half hour mark and we'll go from there. Uh, at that time, roughly about that time, I will, uh, I'm going to post some links uh, that I think will help you guys moving forward on your Esperanto journeys. So if you're, if you're in a hurry and you miss it, I'll also pin it. So Discord lets you pin messages to the channel. You can always look back to the pins. I'll also probably make an announcement or something and, and put those resources in its own uh, channel if you ever want to come back to it. But anyway, it is it is time. I hope everyone's back now. I hope everyone had a good uh, rest. And then Mato, do you... Uh, there you go, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're good to go. Sebi is right, by the way. That is our resources channel. Uh, and it probably has some of the links that I already have prepared, but I have a special list for anybody that attends this class. So, <clears throat> now that we're all back, uh, let's get into examples of sentences. Now, I'm going to try to go through this f as fast as I can, because this I think I ate a lot more time than I intended on the Friday session. I think we did better on Saturday. Um, so this is, again, this is kind of hard and fast. I don't expect memorization. I'm exposing you guys to the syntax and the grammar. You know, because it's... I can tell you all these things about how words are built, but then you don't feel comfortable putting them into sentences yet. And that's where I want to get you guys to by the end of this class, is being able to say sentences in the, uh, you know, in the home channel, for example, with the help of a dictionary. So let's get into it. 
Uh, every now and again, I might ask you guys if you want to try guessing what the sentence means, but it's a little bit hard for me to pick up the vocabulary for you guys uh, at the same time as you're trying to guess what most of the vocabulary is. So feel free to write your translations ahead of time, but uh, I won't make a big deal of it. <clears throat> Me estas codeweaver. That one's uh, that one kind of speaks for itself, right? Uh, and of course, esti is the the verb to be, right? So me estas code weaver. As for proper names, do whatever you want. Literally, just do whatever you want. Uh, you can spell it different, pronounce it different, do nothing to it. I've done nothing here. Do whatever you want. <laughs> me fartas bone. So farti uh, is not to fart. I promise. It's to fare. Like, you know, I'm faring well today. And that's the uh, the way in Esperanto that we express, you know, how you're doing. So, I'm doing well. Uh, or if you were asking someone how they were doing, you'd say, you know, Qui el vi fartas, right? And we'll get more on questions towards the end of class. But, uh, mi fartas bona. I am faring well. I'm doing well. Studentoi sidas en la clase chambro. I talked about pretty much all of these words at one point or another, or they're uh, uh, self-evident. You know, students, I said earlier, CD is to sit. I think I said that earlier. Uh, en la, I think that speaks for itself, in the. And then here's a combined word, class chambro. That's the name of the channel that we're in here, but that also means uh, classroom. Uh, and again, about you know whether you use an O or not in combining words. I've seen class or chambro before. I kind of prefer class chambro. Um, but here's an example with a preposition, and here's going to be a couple more as well. But students sit in the classroom. Ni iros al la parco. We will go, don't forget the will go, it's future tense, that os ending, iri is to go, so will go to the park. And and that's another preposition there, to, towards, at, right? Li devas for iri. For all you guys know, that could be a separate word, uh, for iri. There are definitely larger words in Esperanto that coincidentally have smaller words in them. I, I, I think every language has that to some degree, uh, kind of unavoidably. Uh, but as a matter of fact, no, this is a proper combined word. It's for ir i. Uh, now I just set up here, ir is to go. So what does for mean? Uh, it means far, it means away, you know, off in the distance, right? So this essentially means to go away or to leave. He Li is he. He must leave. Right, and we covered uh, devas earlier as well. <clears throat> I should probably write these uh, translations side by side. He must leave. We will go to the park. Students sit in the classroom. Uh, I'll leave these as just, there's, those are kind of self-evident. <clears throat> we devas for iri. Vi lernas pri esperanto. I actually will give you time to guess what that one means, maybe, uh, before I write the translation up. I'll go ahead with the next sentences, but vi lernas pri esperanto. What does that probably mean? She volas krei lingvon. She wants to create a language. So here's... <clears throat> Now that I've written up a couple sentences, there's a couple good things to talk about here. Uh, first of all, let's talk about la. La is the word for the, and it's the only article in Esperanto. There's not a different word for the. Um, you know, if you're familiar with French or German, they have a lot more words for the. La never changes. There is not a word for a or an. So the absence of la pretty much means a or an. So, she volas krei lingvon. There's no a or an there, but there would be in English. She wants to create a language. Uh, another thing to point out here is now we have two examples of where we use the infinitive. See, most of these sentences have an as ending or, or os, or, you know, they, they could have is. You know, those are, that would be a, a real verb, so-called, uh, real mode. Uh, 
a, a phrase has one real verb to it. So if you have more, those have to be infinitive. And I know I kind of glossed over what that means, other than it's it's you know to do something, right? That's the infinitive. But um, you can see here how uh, she wants to create, wants to create, and that e ending there. It almost doesn't work with with with. Devi, because uh, we just word that strangely in English, I suppose. Uh, but it, it is if you write it as he has to leave. You know, has to leave. Uh, must, for some reason, we can leave off the two. But that's still, that's a good hint as to when the uh, E ending, the infinitive, is appropriate. And if I had multiple more verbs, uh, they would all still be infinitive. You know, uh, I wanted to, needed to have to, I mean, there's so many, wanted to, need to have to, you know, could add as many as you want. There's all two in front of all of those. Those are all going to be infinitive. So, Shivolas Krei Lingvon. Let's see, did anybody put down a guess for this one. Ah, yes, two, yeah, okay. You learn about Esperanto, you learned Esperanto. So, actually, that's a good, that's a good guess. Learned, it wouldn't be learned. Learned would be past tense, so that would be lernis. Vi lernis pre Esperanto. And also, there is this extra word there, uh, that's another preposition meaning about. I know that you wouldn't necessarily know which preposition that is, but there is a preposition there. So this, uh, let me change it back to the proper form. Uh, but that's close, very good. Vilernas pri Esperanto would be... Ooh, you learn about Esperanto. There is a way to leave off the about. You could just say learn Esperanto, but I will get back to that uh, in a little bit. And last but not least, I have these two... I, I, I Feel free to put your guesses in on these. I have two sentences that have uh, something strange about them as far as native English speakers are concerned. Pluvas multe exter... Whoops. Exter la domo. Uh, I'll give you some of these words. Pluvi is to rain. Multe, mult is like, you know, multiple, many, several, a lot. Uh, exter is a preposition meaning outside. And the domo is the house, right? So having been given those words, come up with the best English translation for pluvas multe exter la domo. And then once you've done that, estas multae lernantoi jodia. Whoops. Uh, similar thing going on. We've covered estas, we've covered multai. I want to see if we can guess lernantoi. Uh, jodiao means today. Right, so that's another one of those words that doesn't necessarily have a part of speech ending. Zamenhof created a bunch of ow words to kind of mark them as uh, falling outside that paradigm, but that means today. And it works a lot like an adverb if you're curious. All right, very good, guys. You're all you're all getting it. You're finding the missing piece, and I'm proud of you. So, it's raining a lot outside the house. Now, you guys seem to get it already, but the the purpose of these example sentences is to show the dummy subject, as we call it. In English, a complete sentence must have a subject and a verb. There are, of course, informal English sentences where we may drop one or the other, but uh, a complete sentence that has to have a subject, and therefore we make one up if there wouldn't already be one. We don't do that in Esperanto. The, the absence of a subject is meaningful in Esperanto. So, it's raining would just be pluvas. A good rule of thumb as to when you would uh, leave off the subject is when you're talking about something that's just happening. You're not really talking about where it's coming from. You could put a word in front and say the clouds are raining or the sky is raining, and that's fine. But if we're talking about rain is occurring, rain is happening, we just say pluvas. And a similar vein here, estas multi lernantoi jodiao, there are many learners today. So very good. I saw good guesses there. Very good. Uh, this is a good time to talk about adjectival agreement, by the way. So 
or a plural in general, I should say. You may have caught me here. Students, plural, sit in the classroom. The plural marker is the letter yo uh, at the end of the word. Studentoi is students. However, another thing about Esperanto is that adjectives must agree with their nouns. So, you know, me, uh, let's see. Estas ruja pomo, right? There is a red apple. If I wanted to say there are red apples, the cool thing is that the verb doesn't have to change like I just did in English. Um, but it's not sufficient to just pluralize the, the word apple, pomo. You have to pluralize all of the adjectives as well. All right? So no, don't forget that. One other thing that's worth bringing up now is freedom of word order. Right? So, and, and we'll... We'll actually cover that a little bit more after the, the upcoming section, but there are good opportunities here to show how we can play around with the word order. Um, it's not strictly subject, verb, object, or whatever you're familiar with, um, but there are a couple rules still. Prepositions still have to go in front of the things that they're describing. That's what preposition means, is it's, it's going, it's preceding. Uh, something preposition so a preposition is like in at uh, around by uh, uh, under on things like that um, so it wouldn't be okay for me to put al that's the preposition to I couldn't put that wherever I want because that changes the meaning al ni iros la parco that's saying the park is going to come to us Ooh, that's <laughs> that's creepy right so that you would have to preserve the article as well la has to go in front of the thing that's being described so even if i had adjectives there la granda parco i couldn't say al granda la parco that wouldn't work right that's one term what i could do though is rearrange the adjectives and the nouns i could say Granda after the noun. I could say La Parco Granda. So you have a lot of wiggle room here uh, as as you see fit. And you could also say, you know, instead of ni iros, you could say iros ni al la parco. You could say al la parco, whoops, al la parco ni iros. Al la parco iros ni. You have all of these at your disposal. And we're going to talk a little bit more later about a very special feature that enables that. Ni iros al la parco. Let me fix that first. <clears throat> okay, let's see. So there's some good sentences there. Let's talk about this really quick. And I, and I do want to keep it short uh, because m this is one of those things that you got to get a feel for through more examples that you will encounter on your journey but i do have a couple good examples for you today you uh, it seems like people guess properly uh, that lernanto means learner you could have you, you could see the learn uh, vi lernas pre esperanto we established that uh, but what's this suffix anto it's actually special I told you guys about some suffixes earlier, and I also said I wouldn't get to all of them because there's a lot, and that most of them work as you know proper words in their own right. But this is a very special uh, suffix that merits its own attention. Uh, this is what's called as a participle uh, ending, and I'm going to show here they correspond to the endings. Uh, of the, the verb endings, right? So, is is, you know, past tense verb, as is present tense, future tense, conditional. Uh, this is the past participle, the present participle, the future participle, and the conditional participle. So, what is a participle? Participle is when we take a verb and we, we basically make an adjective of it. So, participle, verb, to adjective, if you will. Let's look at an example of that. La, uh, let's see, the glass falls. La glaso falas. That, there's no participle in that, that's just a normal sentence in English and correspondingly in Esperanto. La glaso falas. Falas, fali is to fall, that's the verb there. What do, what do we do when we want to say the falling glass? 
la falanta glaso. So that is a participle. That's an example of a participle. Now, ing has a couple other uses in English, so again, don't think of it one-to-one. -one. Ing could also turn a verb into a noun. Uh, I like gaming would be a uh, verb as a noun. Me shatas, whoops, shatas uh, ludadon. All right, but forget about that for now. Uh, participle, though, is when we're turning it into an adjective. And we're describing the, the object, or the, excuse me, the thing, the glass in this case, by the action that it's undertaking, right? Now, how about this? The glass is falling. La glaso estas falanta. This is the word-for-word -word translation of this, and grammatically it works. The glass is falling. La glaso estas falanta. Right, so there's another example of, of where a participle comes into place. The actual verb here is is. Here, there is not a verb at all. That's not a complete sentence. There's no verb in that phrase, in that sentence. Uh, fall is a verb, but here it's being used as a participle. Same situation here, but this is a sentence now. We have estas, we have is. Falling is still the participle. Now, I gave you this word-for-word -word translation so that you could uh, establish that relationship in your mind. But I'm going to warn you, don't say that. In Esperanto, we do not care the difference between the glass falls and the glass is falling. This is a very big, important distinction in English, and this is a non-existent distinction in Esperanto. So when you want to say the glass is falling, you say, la glaso falas. You know, we, 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 we say the same as the glass falls. But this is a word-for-word -word translation to give you guys a better idea of where uh, participles fit in. Because it's a big part of English, and so you know, it helps to draw from that uh, uh, background. Now, I wanted to bring up Lernanto. So here's the thing. As I was saying earlier, uh, the previous section, we have to respect the inherent part of speech. Of a, of a word before we can mess around with the word endings. Well, all of these participle endings make adjectives. So what happens when we take anta and turn it into anto? We get a doer of an action, which pretty usually corresponds to er, uh, er, in English. So here's a couple examples of that. Let's see. La homo veturanta, the person driving. La veturanto veturas, the driver drives, or the driver is driving, right? The driver drives. Lernanto is someone that is learning, right? Estas lernanta. Very cool stuff. La lernanto lernas. Now, really quick, ant is by far the most common present, uh, the, the participle, the present participle. Uh, I wanted to give you guys some examples of where some of the other ones come in, uh, but they're not terribly uh, common, and it's okay. Uh, just keep in mind why it is the way it is. Whenever you see a, a participle that isn't ant, uh, one really good example is you know la cre into creis. Zamenhof estas la creinto de Esperanto. Zamenhof is the creator of Esperanto. In English, we don't really care so much about the aspect. Um, that's what that's called, by the way, aspect. Uh, the difference between past, present, future participle. But the creating stopped, right? He is no, he is not still creating Esperanto. The, the creating has finished, as far as Zamenhof's concerned, right? He is still credited as the creator, right? That's the present tense. We remember him today as the creator, but the creating has finished for him. So Zamenhof is la creinto de Esperanto. Another one of my favorite examples for the future is la presidonto presidos. So we don't have a separate root for president. We just take presidi, uh, which is to preside, and uh, presidanto would be president. So presidonto could be a way of saying president-elect. 
for example. So that's a cool example because that's something we actually have a word for kind of in English. Uh, the president-elect will preside, will be president, right? So anyway, having gone through all that, folks, if you made it this far, I'm very happy. It is time to get into my favorite subject. I suppose I will leave these up here for future reference, but... The accusative. This is the big one, everyone. This is the one that we make memes about. This is one that the Duolingo owl is, is busting down doors about. The accusative is the hot topic in Esperanto, and I have set aside uh, a, a sizable portion of this class to go through the uses of the accusative because I want to set you guys on the right path. Now, for what it's worth, as, um, the accusative is, is always thought of as difficult. It's more difficult for English speakers because we do not have an accusative, whereas uh, languages like German, uh, all the Slavic languages do. It's a little more familiar there. Um, to English, it's totally foreign, except for pronouns, but that's just... Uh, it's basically the difference between I and me, right? But we'll go about it the Esperanto way. It's actually not hard. It's not hard, it's just tedious. It, it requires you to think a little more actively about the, the words that you put in a sentence. But I'm, I'm covering this in detail because this is often glossed over to beginners. You guys are going to learn some, some not-so-beginner concepts here because when you aren't presented the, the full story, you run into examples later that get a little too confusing. And, and it's hard to reason about them. And I think that's, uh, that's a bad place to leave beginners in. So we're going to go at top to bottom. But the accusative. What is the accusative? It has nothing to do with accusing people. Don't worry. The accusative is a grammatical case. And a grammatical case is something that we mark a word with to change its meaning or to change its role in a sentence. The role it plays in the sentence. The accusative in Esperanto is represented with the ending N. I snuck in an example of this at the top here. She volas krei lingvon. So what do we use the accusative for? Well, there's two uses that belong to the accusative, and there's a couple more that, that we can use the accusative for. And again, I'm covering all of them because if I don't, uh, you'll see one of these examples and you'll be confused. And I would hate to leave you in that situation, but by and uh, far and away, the most common use, the obligatory use of the accusative is to mark the direct object of a uh, verb uh, or, or, or a phrase. So let's look at an example of this. This one is is easier to understand, but it still takes a lot of practice to, to get in the practice of, of not forgetting the accusative. Okay? Mi manjas pomon. I am eating an apple. The apple is the object here, because it is the thing that is being eaten. Therefore, we must put the accusative on it in Esperanto. Now, you might be wondering, why is that necessary? Well, let me tell you how English does it. English is governed a lot more strictly by word order. Everything is subject, verb, object. If you want to play with the word order even a little bit, it sounds very poetic, and you have to put in commas, and it's just a weird... It's subject, verb, object in English. And Zamenhof didn't want to constrain the word order in Esperanto, because... Potentially, speakers would be coming from their native languages, and they'd be familiar with SVO, a subject, verb, object, or they'd be familiar with OSV or VSO. There's all kinds of uh, word orders in the world, and he wanted to accommodate all of them. So we'll see a couple examples later that, that make it more clear how helpful this can be. But as an example, pomon manjas me, right? I have changed the word order. Apple eats I. This means the same as this. The meaning has not changed. Pomon manjasmi. 
You could also say Pomon Mi Manjas. I just saw that in the chat. Very good, Sebi. Pomon Mi Manjas. You can order these in any way, and that will not change the meaning of this sentence as long as it's spelled exactly as it is. If I say Mi Manjas Pomo, that is an error. If I say Min Manjas Pomo, we have a mutant apple on our hands, and that's very concerning. Right? So, as I showed earlier, you know, the, the word order is very free. And that, that applies to entire parts of a sentence. So, you know, this prepositional part, that's one part. The verb is another part. The subject is another part. And the object would be yet another part that you could play around with. So a sentence like this, you know, it doesn't, this doesn't have any prepositions, doesn't have any articles. So between these four words, you could put them in any order you wanted. And the accusative goes the extra mile in helping us achieve that without uh, being too confusing, right? Now, number two. The other use of the accusative is to mark, whoops, to mark direction or movement towards or into or at, etc. Direction or movement. So, on its own, this would look like ni uh, iras londonon. So the city of London, of course, that's a proper noun. Uh, to Esperantize it, we add an o, and then uh, we've added the accusative here. Now, here's the thing. Verbs can be either transitive or intransitive. A transitive verb takes an object, and intransitive does not. Estas is an intransitive verb, for example. Uh, so, code weaver, this is not an object, and the reason being is because code weaver and me, we're talking about the same thing here. You know, those that's referring to the same thing. Therefore, this is not an object, and this is not a transitive verb. It's intransitive. Uh, farti, how how you're faring? That's intransitive. There's no objects that you're faring to. Right, and and if you really had to come up with such an expression, uh, f faring to someone, you would use the preposition al. You know, that's that's more like the dative. That's to, towards, at. You know, the recipient of an action maybe. Um, sidi to sit is intransitive. To iri to go is intransitive. So what happens here? Well, this is not the object. This is simply uh, an example of of the number two here. Uh, we're showing direction towards. Iri is intransitive because if you're going somewhere, the somewhere is not receiving your going. You're not, it's not being, nothing's being done to it. You're simply moving your location and that's where it happens to be. Uh, so Iri doesn't take an object. Uh, and this is not an object, but we are using the accusative to show uh, we're going to London. That is attested but it's not preferred. We would usually say iras al londono. And by all means, I encourage you guys to use this form as well. But if you ever see this form, now you know, you know that that can happen. What's much more common, however, is in conjunction with a preposition. Let me make this very clear. The accusative does not follow the preposition, except for this one case. But I'm wording it like that because it's very easy to uh, be confused and to put the accusative after a preposition because it sounds right. This is a very good example, I think. Vi lernas pri esperanto. If you came up with the sentence yourself and you were thinking about it half-heartedly, you might think that there belongs an accusative there. As a rule of thumb, you know that there's not because that's a preposition, and there's a preposition in front of it. The prepositions govern the nominative. A nominative is the other case. If, if it's not in the accusative, it's in the nominative, and that's all prepositions. So this one exception, though, is very handy. La cato saltas sur la tablo, which is... Let's see. The cat jumps on th the table. There we go. The cat jumps on the table. Sur is the preposition on. This is that the cat is already on the table and is jumping. Or, or at least has jumped once on the table. If we wanted to express that it has jumped onto the table, 
this is where the accusative comes in. So this is the same thing here. Uh, it's, it's an accusative of, of direction or movement, but this is the one case where it may follow a preposition and it has this, this very clever meaning. Right, la cato salta sur la tablon would be the cat jumps onto the table, and the, and there's a clear relationship here as to what we do in English to achieve the same meaning. But uh, this is a much more regular solution, you know, because here's another example: la hundo impetas sub la lito. Right, the dog rushes under the bed. In English, we don't have like a different way to word this. It's just kind of understood that, okay, the dog went under the bed, you know, rushed under the bed. In Esperanto, though, that's not what this means. This means that the dog is already uh, under the bed and is rushing about, which, I mean, you know, that makes sense. It has a meaning, but that's probably not the meaning we intended, right? We want to put the accusative there to show uh, movement under the bed, movement towards under the bed. All right. the, la hundo impeta sub la liton. The dog rushes under the bed. <clears throat> so there you have it. That's, oh, uh, and, and adverbs as well. Almost forgot. You can also use the accusative of direction with adverbs. Uh, so an example of that would be, uh, okay, so hemo is, is the word for home, uh, and that's a noun. We also use heime. Uh, for a lot of adverbial constructions, as we do in, in English. Um, Mi restas heime. I, I'm staying home. I'm resting at home, right? I'm resting home. But uh, mi iras heimen shows that I'm going home. And the, the accusative there shows the direction towards. Mi iras heimen. So there's the, the third situation where you can mark direction with the accusative. So that's that's the big stuff. However, I have to point out the accusative can be and, and often is used as well to show measurement and time. <clears throat> so let's take a look at that really quick. An example for time, I'll do time first because uh, reasons. Mi vekijas la okan horon. I wake up at 8 o'clock. Uh, and that's how we say, you know, something o'clock in uh, Esperanto is the eighth hour, right? But I wake up at eight o'clock. The eighth hour. There we go. Mi vekijas la okan horon. Vekiji, if I have time, I will get into why. It's, it's, it's because of this suffix ij. Uh, but vekijas is also an intransitive verb. Uh, it's to awaken, right? You know, you're waking yourself up. So, mi vekijas la okan horon. There's no uh, confusion here. That couldn't be an object because that's intransitive. So it must be. Uh, it must be time. And as for measurement, uh, I actually had a good example here. Yeah, here we go. La curso dauras prescau tri horoin. That's time too. Uh, you know the the, the word horo is is hour, uh, but this is this is a duration of time. This is measurement. Uh, the difference here is this is a specific moment that something happens. Right. I couldn't think of a better example that didn't still have to do with time. But anyway, l the course lasts almost three hours, right? And it's lasting uh, three horoin, and that's in the accusative as well. Now here's the thing about these. <clears throat> uh, let me put that in as well. The course lasts almost three hours. Here's the thing about these. You can also instead use the preposition yeah. In fact, it's preferable. Where should I put that? I'll put that there for now. You can also use the preposition yeah. And it's it's much preferable in most cases. So Instead, we could say la curso dauras pres uh, ye prescau tri horoi. And there's no more accusative there because, you know, preposition. Or mi vekijas ye la oka horo. 
So what's going on here? Ye is a special preposition. Ye does not have a definite meaning. It is the uh, undefined preposition, if you will. Now, why does this exist? Well, Zamenhof advises us to use the most literal preposition for a given situation. So, you know, for example, sur is on or on top of. And if you're literally on a table, that's, that's the appropriate uh, preposition to use. But uh, when I say in English that something is going to happen on Sunday, that's weird. That's idiomatic. We're not on Sunday. There's no on top of there. We, that's just uh, something we say. So every natural language has its idiosyncrasies when it comes to prepositions. So yeah is introduced for the situations that there isn't a literal preposition for. And the most common uses here are, are for measurement and for time. These aren't the only uses, but they're especially common. So now here's the kicker. In the fundamento, one of the 16 rules is that any case of ye, any instance of ye, I should say, can be replaced with the accusative, particularly if it wouldn't be ambiguous. So it, is, it especially works here because there wouldn't be an object because, you know, that's intransitive, that's intransitive. But um, so that's where we get these from. Mi vekijas la okan horon. Time is not inherent to the accusative. O only these first two things are. But you see these often as well because people... Uh, can and do change out ye with the accusative. But these are actually expressions that we use ye with. Now, if you're wondering why, you know, what sense does that make, uh, consider this. In English, we we leave it up to word order and uh, good luck. <laughs> but this is a little bit more like what we say in English. The course lasts almost three hours, word for word. When we add this preposition, that's a preposition that we wouldn't, we, we don't have any preposition there in English. So that's, you know, the idea is that maybe the accusative would, would uh, come off better. You know, you, you have that opportunity. But these are actually ye. Yeah. And the cool thing is that we can do it in the other direction that is accusative to ye. Yeah. So let's take a sentence like, me shatas Minecraft. Okay, Minecraft. Uh, shat, uh, shati is to like, to enjoy. So, Mishatas Minecraft. Uh, now, I said earlier you can do whatever you want with proper nouns, but how do you accusativize a proper noun? You have so many options. You could do literally nothing. You could put uh, an O-N at the end. You could do it with a hyphen, or you could just do the N and no O, or you could totally change the spelling of the word and like totally esperantize it uh there is a proposed unofficial preposition na for this purpose but they clearly haven't heard of yeah because that is my preferred method for dealing with that situation and if it's uh, if it's reasonable enough I'll, I'll say this sometimes as well uh but now you know yeah and the accusative have this bond now, some people would argue with me how tight that bond really is. I think it's fair to say there could be a, a nuance of, of difference. Uh, you know, ye dio, for example, would, would be like saying, by God. And uh, simply saying dion, <laughs> I don't think that has the same meaning. So it's, it, it, it's fair to treat these as separate, but that is this special relationship. But folks, that is it. That is the uses of the accusative. So now you won't be confused when you see this. Because if I hadn't explained it, you would be thinking to yourself, okay, well, it's not direction. Is that like an object? I mean, is that, you know, how does that work, right? But now you know, the more you know, right? Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Last example I have about the accusative is uh, predicates. I'm not going to spend very much time on this. Um, I spent maybe a little too much time on it on Friday and Saturday, but I have one example that I would like to show you guys. And this time, feel free to put your responses in the chat. Me, uh, uh, let's see. We're painting the house green. I want you guys to try translating that 
into Esperanto. Uh, and I'll give you the words uh, without their forms necessarily matching. We is ni, uh, to paint is farbi, uh, you know, la, domo, and then green is verda. But make sure the, the endings match as they should and try to translate this to Esperanto. <clears throat> Also, Alchemiisto, I saw your question, and that is a good question, and we are doing good on time today, so I should be able to do one example of that. Mm. So let's see. <laughs> I see ni farbas la homon verde, that would be person, but fair enough. <laughs> We're painting the house green. First of all, uh, good job on the ending for Farbi. I'm, I'm seeing Farba, so that's correct. You didn't you didn't forget that one. That's good. There's a couple words for uh, uh, paint. I mean, there's there's pen three, but that has to do more with like art, you know, painting. Uh, but ni Farbi la domo verda. We're painting the house green. Let me give you guys the answer. Ni Farbas la domo verda. So a lot of you guessed that an accusative would go here, and I'm showing you this example to show you uh, why not, because you'll inevitably come upon a sentence like this and be very confused. Nausicaa got it right. You got it right at the last moment. Very good. Nifarbas la domon verdan is saying we're painting the greenhouse. And it becomes a lot more clear if I rearrange the, the words here. Remember, word order's free, so the adjective can come after all at once, and that doesn't change anything. So, ni farbas la verdan domon, or ni farbas la domon verdan, makes no difference, but that is, we're painting the greenhouse, it's already green. Now, you know, fair enough, you, you, that's a plausible sentence, but we're painting the house to be green, suddenly we don't have the uh, accusative there anymore. And why is that? This is called a, a predicate, uh, or, or in other words, a complement. Here we are complementing the verb. Uh, now it's not necessarily an adverb, which is which is uh, describing or, or modifying the verb. But ni farbas la domon verda. We actually leave off the accusative here to distinguish it from the greenhouse versus uh, we're painting a house to be green, right? So keep that in mind in the future. I also saw a couple other clever uh, takes on it. Mi verd farbas la domon. That works. That's kind of strange, kind of poetic, but to make a combined word in that way, it works. Uh, I saw ni farbas la domon verde. That works too. That's like saying we're painting the house greenly. We, we greenly paint the house. And that's not as strange in Esperanto as it, as it may sound in, in English. You know, that's appropriate. Uh, but I didn't want to use that as a crutch because you can absolutely see this as well. And I wanted to make it clear why Verda is not agreeing with uh, Domo there. Yeah, I told you guys earlier the adjectives have to agree. I mentioned that with plurals. And I, I think you all were, were following me there. But, you know, of course it has to follow with the uh, accusative as well. But... Uh, Good guess on that. You can also put Verda there, by the way, because it's not uh, strictly describing the house. So again, free word order, right? Uh, let's see, let's see. So I saw one good question, and there was another good question I had yesterday I wanted to get to. Uh, I'll do just one example each to make sure I don't go over, but we're doing pretty good here. Uh, let's see, we're painting the house green. The question I saw... When the verb takes two objects, a direct and indirect, very good. So, the accusative marks the direct object. For all intents and purposes, the indirect object is governed by al, the preposition al, to. Uh, so, let me think of an example of this. That would be like, mi uh, diris ion al shi. Okay, so io is the word for something. So, I said, Didi is to say, so I said something to her. Or in English, you could say, I told her something. But you would still say it this way in, in Esperanto, right? Mi didis ion al shi. And the indirect object gets al. However, 
Uh, your question also brought up uh, something in my mind uh, that I wanted to talk about as well. What if you have two direct objects in a sentence? It's time to talk about each and ig, and, and I'm gonna gloss over this a bit because this is another thing, just like participles. You'll have to see it in a lot more words to get the hang of it. But each is, uh... To become uh, well, it's not it's not strictly a verb in its own right, but it, it, it you you apply it to a verb to add that something is becoming a certain way, and ig is to cause. It's a causative. So these also affect the transitivity of a, of a verb notably. So boni, as I said earlier, is to be good. Uh, to be is is intransitive, right? So to be good is is intransitive. Uh, mi bonas, that's intransitive. Bonigas or bonigi, that is to cause something to be good. And suddenly it's transitive now. We have an object for that. Bonigi io. Uh, uh, conversely, veki is a transitive verb to wake something, to wake something up. So in that earlier example, mi vekijas la okan horon, I did have time after all, vekiji, uh, I become awake. That's an intransitive visor. You know, now that's an intransitive verb. But what happens when I take a transitive verb and add ig to it? Uh, I had to come up with an example yesterday on the spot, and I'll have to do it again today. Um, I think I just used this example again. So, ni uh, farbigas la broson ye la don. There's an example of one way we could get around to having two direct objects. So, uh, broso is brush. There's probably a couple words for brush, but I found that one. Uh, so, farbi is to paint, to paint something. So, farbigi is to cause something to paint. So, this is kind of a, of a, of a uh, convoluted example here, but we're causing the brush uh, to paint the house. So, one way to get around having two objects is for one to take the accusative and one to be governed by yet. But that's not the only way you can solve this. Uh, especially back in Zamenhof's time, I think it was more common to do ni farbigas uh, al labroso la domon. Uh, or perhaps you could say labroson al la domo. Uh, you, you had some room to work with there. And you could make one of these objects uh, less direct, right? So there's a couple things going on there. But that was a good question because there's, it's definitely that sense. And then there was a second thing. Yes, somebody yesterday asked, why do words like saluton, uh, bonvenon, dankon, why do words like this always end in the accusative? See, I had to explain the accusative first before we could get, even get into these phrases. Mm. Saluton is hello, bonvenon is welcome, dankon is, is thanks. And the reason these all have the accusative is because they're, you know, that's not a sentence on its own, but it, it belongs to a, a larger sentence, logically speaking, and that's the role it would play in, in such a sentence. So when, when we say saluton, that's short for something along the lines of mi diras al vi saluton. I, I tell you a hello, or you could say me dona salvi saluta. I give you a hello. It's not it's not terribly important what the sentence would be that you're not, not saying, but that's how that fits in to the overall sentence. Or uh, you know, same thing with with dancon. Me donas alvi dancon. And you're probably we uh, we're probably wondering though why is that helpful? You know, th this is kind of a uh, confusing, right? Here's an example where it matters. We played a game of chess, and it was a good game, and I told my opponent after, good game. Should that be bona ludo or bonan ludon? Feel free to write your responses while I uh, take a sip of some water. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Oh, yeah, could. Mm-hmm. Um, the phrase, by the way, that uh, is unsaid is mi desires alvi. Oh, that's better. Yeah, that's a lot better. Uh, Desira Salvi. That's especially... Uh, I, I would have got that one with uh, Bonan Tagon. Me, Desiras Alvi. Uh, Bonan Tagon. Very good. Desiras works a lot better there. So there's there's a there's a hidden part there that 
Yeah. Necessitates. Well, I mean, I had to just double check in the Cresta Matteo. Yeah, it says it right there. <laughs> thank you. No, actually, I, I was really blanking there, so thank you. Uh, so I see a variety of guesses. They're all good guesses. We played a game. We played a game. Let's say it's chess. One of us say good game after. That would be Bonaludo. That would be Bonaludo because we're saying like Tio Estis Bonaludo. That was a good game. Right? Bonanludon is something more appropriate to say at the beginning of the game. Mi eh, desiras al ni bonan ludon, or mi esperas bonan ludon, kai tiel plu. Right? So that's a situation, rare as it is, where the accusative makes a difference even in, in the tiniest of phrases like this. So that is, that is very good, very good. Uh, let's see. Okay. <laughs> we are, I, I gotta be honest with you guys, we're doing so much better on, on time today uh, compared to how it's gone in the past uh, two sessions. So, what I would talk about now is the correlatives. However, I, I think given the time constraints, uh, we've decided that that's something you guys should probably explore on your own, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and... and tell you what it is uh, for anybody who doesn't know as a, one other key feature of Esperanto is the correlatives which is a, a group of five prefixes and nine suffixes that when you mix and match these it makes 45 words in a regular pattern and these words are some of the most important in the language and I've been kind of glossing over it because uh, I don't assume that you already know these words but it's your question words you know like um, who what when where how and why uh, a lot of those start with WH uh, in in English but you know how doesn't it's not totally regular in Esperanto it's totally regular all of those question words start with key and those are all part of the the correlatives table all of your Demonstratives start with T. That's your TH words in English. There, that, uh, that person, those, that amount. Uh, you know, and your E's are your, your sums, some, somehow, somewhere, some reason. And your. Whoops. Cheese are your everies, your nennies are your nuns. Anyway, so when I give you guys the resources at the end of class it has a cheat sheet that has the correlatives right on there I thought it might be fun to do a little participation thing for that but I trust you guys can do it on your own uh, and and that would take a bit of time so I'm gonna leave that to you guys but we do have time to talk about uh, there's two lessons left today or two parts I want to introduce you guys to some more complex sentences and then I want to do a little exercise at the end uh, that I like to call searching for cognates. And that is a participation thing. Uh, that part might go over a little bit, you know, five, ten minutes. So I'll just let you, I'll let you guys know how we're doing before then. I know some of you have only exactly two and a half hours. Uh, but after all is said and done, I don't have anywhere to be. So after class, anybody that's still here, if you guys have questions, bring them on. Me and uh, Marokuyo will... We'll be here as long as we both can, and, and we'll be happy to answer questions and such. But let's see, complex sentences. So it'll, I'll have to think a bit about, about examples for this. I didn't have too many example sentences, but I wanted to mostly talk about how to form questions and how to use conjunctions properly. So let's start with talking about questions. The question word that merits knowing is CHU. Let's actually start by looking at it in English. Uh, you went to the park. That's a statement. That's a sentence. If we turn this into a question, it becomes, did you go to the park? So we add a verb here, an auxiliary verb, uh, did or do or, or such. <clears throat> uh, this becomes infinitive. Uh, and, and we, re we reorder a little bit. Uh, from what little German class I took in high school in German, you tend to reorder the, the words. Um, every language handles questions in a couple different ways. Here's what we do in Esperanto. Uh, 
vi iris al la parco is you went to the park. Chu vi iris al la parco. And that is a question all of a sudden, just that one word. Chu vi iris al la parco. And again, the rest of the sentence could still be ordered however you want, kind of. I mean, you, you have the free order to play with. Chu vi al la parco iris. Chu al la parco vi iris. Uh, you wouldn't break up al la parco, and I described that earlier, but... You also shouldn't move chu. I haven't been able to find a, a specific rule that confirms that you cannot. But if you were to say, uh, a la parco chu vi iris, you know what? That's not too confusing. I would caution against doing that. Uh, that's not very attested uh, from what I've seen. Uh, question words generally come at the beginning. So true is your question word for yes, no. It's your question word for true or false. Anytime that there's a one or the other kind of answer, true. But that's not the only question word. Yeah, we're we're kind of grazing over the correlatives, but you still have your who, what, when, where, why, and how. And you know that would be like kiel vi fartas. How are you doing? You know that's the word for how. And that's the question right there. But it's, it's important to have a question word somewhere, preferably at the beginning, because intonation isn't enough. In an online chat room or in, in writing, in informal writing, a question mark might suffice. It helps to have this at the beginning, though, because then you know it's a question. Um, but, but if you were to not have that word there and you were speaking to somebody, every language intonates questions differently. I mean, God help them to figure out that you were asking a question. So that's why it's important. That's why we harp on, on making sure to not drop the, the whichever question word is there. Uh, despite what I just said about it coming at the beginning, you will see this a lot as well. Vi iris al la parco, chu, or chu ne, or uh, if you're asking, like, really? You know, it might be chu vere. So you can, you can uh, put a comma and, and put it at the end here. Uh, you can do that sometimes. Uh, so it's okay if you're, if you're speaking and you forgot. You can always follow it with chu. But uh, there you go for questions. Now, here's another fascinating thing about Esperanto. This is something that isn't immediately clear until you until you start thinking about your native language. So that's really funny. Uh, if, if your native language is something European, be it English or a Romance language or a Germanic language, uh, th uh, or probably Slavic languages work this way as well, this will be very shockingly similar to you. Question words aren't just for questions. I know, that's that's a big bomb, but it's actually this way in English, too. Let me pull up one of my examples that I wrote down somewhere. Oh, I actually did write a couple. Okay, we're saved. <laughs> um, let's see. Mi nestias chu la festo ocasos. So, this word okazi, it resembles the word occasion. This is the word for if, if something is occurring or happening, right? So, uh, what this sentence means is, I don't know whether the party will happen. should probably resize the window there. I don't know whether the party will happen. Minestias, chu la festo ocasos. So, true is our question word, as I just described, but... You can also use it as a conjunction in this way, to link two uh, phrases, two clauses together. Minestias is uh, kind of a, of a complete sentence. It should have an object um, or a, uh, a following clause. And, and here we have a clause that follows. Uh, la festo o casos, you know, that's an independent clause. That's, that could be a sentence on its own. We use a conjunction to link those. Conjunctions are your words like uh, and, but, uh, let's see. Would or be a conjunction? Uh, Mario Curio, do you know off the top of your head? No, oh, because would be. Uh, and say it one more time. Would, would or be a conjunction, technically? Or is that um, something else? Yeah, I would say. I think so, because it's like and, you know, if and is a conjunction, or certainly is, so, and, but, or, because, uh, if, you know, these are all, uh, for spacing, uh, these are all conjunctions in that they link two clauses together, and these words are, you know, kai, sed, au, se, char, whoops, char, 
uh, chu can also be used in this way. Question words can also be used in this way, and that's that's what's being demonstrated here. So here, chu is being used like weather, not weather as in it's raining outside, but you know you can see. Uh, so here's a couple other examples with uh, conjunctions. Ni che estos la feston se estos cuco. We will attend the party if there will be cake. You know, an if is a conjunction there. I encourage you all to hunt down the conjunctions. That's a closed class of words. You know, there's only so many of them. Same to be said of prepositions. These are words that I'm not giving you word lists for in class, but when I give you guys resources after, and, and, and among those resources is a cheat sheet, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the cheat sheet has uh, uh, nearly all the prepositions and some, if not all, of the conjunctions as well. And this is the next step in unlocking more complicated, more expressive sentences. You know, so that you can graduate from the hello, how are you uh, today, uh, what's your favorite color, you know, those kinds of sentences. You know, this is the, the next step. Uh, but like I started to say and demonstrated here, question words can be used as conjunctions as well, and that's actually rather common. So. Here's an example. I appear to have written the example somewhere else. There we go. Chuvistias, kie la libro restas. Do you know where the book lies or where the book is? Where uh, is is a question word, but the actual question being asked here is, do you know? Right. This is. This is a conjunction here. This is linking the two clauses. Um, here's another example. Mi conas la viron kiun vi jus rencontis. So, renconti is, uh, it comes from the word to encounter, it's to meet, right? Mi conas la viron kiun vi jus rencontis. Let me put the translation there. I know of. They make a distinction in most European languages, including Esperanto. We don't in English. But I know of the man whom you just met. Right? So whom, you know, that's a question word. But there's no question here. This is a conjunction. And that works exactly the same in Esperanto as it does in English. So that's very cool. It's another thing to be thinking about. That you, that you probably weren't already thinking about. You're not in the habit of thinking of it that way in English, but it's actually just like you'd expect. Uh, also, I know I didn't go over the correlatives per se, except to tell you the question words are key, and the TH words, the demonstratives are T. So here's another thing that you'll see a lot of. Mi conas tiun kiun vi jus rencontis. So this pretty much means the same thing, except instead of man, we're saying that person. I know that person whom you just met. We'll see this a lot in Esperanto, is these T-key pairs. Um, and I don't have terribly many examples of when you would or, or wouldn't do that, but uh, this is a common construction that you can, you can get used to. Uh, but still using the question words in this way just like English. Now here's something that's not like English. Here is a word of caution. In English we have a tendency to say I know the man you just met. I know the man you just met. If you were to render that in Esperanto exactly you would get uh, this. Mi conas la virun vijus rencontis. And you cannot do that. It's illegal. The Esperanto police will get you. <laughs> no, but uh, you can't do that because viron here is, is being the object of both conas and rencontis. And that is a no-no. Right? You have to have a, a separate object for each verb. So you would have to say it like this. You know, we have a tendency to drop this conjunction in English, and that's okay. The conjunction must be there. But that's still not unlike English. It's just a more formal way of going about it. So make sure not to forget it. Uh, let's see. Last example I wanted to cover was the use of the word ke. Uh, ke is another uh, 
prepos uh, <laughs> excuse me, conjunction. I knew that wasn't right, and I said it anyway. Ke is another conjunction. It roughly means that. But English has overloaded the word that. You know, that in English can mean a lot of different things. So I wanted to use a, a, an example sentence for this. Uh, Mi pensas que Esperanto... Whoops. Ah, jeez. Que Esperanto estas bela lingvo. I think that Esperanto is a beautiful language. I just wanted to get that out there because... Uh, if you look up what the word that is in, in Esperanto, first of all, tio is that, as in, you know, uh, that thing, or tiu is like that one or that person. Uh, and you might also not suspect that there's a word that's one to one with using that as a conjunction, but there is, it's ke. So anyway, but there's a couple conjunctions for you. There's probably more that I forgot. Um, and there's also how to do questions and how to put together some phrases, some more complicated sentences. All right, we have about eight minutes left. Again, we might go over a couple minutes, like like four, you know. So uh, I understand if anybody like super duper has to go right at the minute. It won't hurt my feelings. That's okay. But we're just going to go into the last lesson uh, and then we'll, we'll close down and we'll open up for questions. Uh, if, if Marokuyo is going to sing, we're going to figure that out. <laughs> you don't have to, buddy. Uh, let's see. Searching for cognates. You guys are lucky. I've had the two sessions this weekend to practice and, and do it a little better, a little more efficiently. Uh, the previous groups had to stay after class if they wanted to do this, but we have time today. Uh, I'm going to wipe off the board here, as it were, the chalkboard, and I'm going to ask for participants again. Uh, feel free to put your names down right now if you volunteer, uh, and, and we'll get that going in a moment. But let me say, in my opinion, the hardest part of learning Esperanto for real is expanding your vocabulary. Now, vocabulary is something you never fully conquer in any language. Uh, even your native language, you learn new words all the time. Uh, you maybe don't ever f find a word is missing or lacking. You know, you always have a word that you can use, but uh, in, in literature, uh, you, you come across new words all the time. But if you were to learn a natural language, the grammar is so much more difficult. It's, it's overwhelming that uh, you, you could be in a situation where you know all the words you need, but you may not know the best way to arrange them, and you're not, you're not certain about the, the, the grammar. Esperanto is not really like that. You can master the grammar in a matter of... I, I wouldn't say I've mastered it. I mean, I have more to learn, but I feel extremely comfortable with the grammar that I could write any sentence I needed to given the words. So that's kind of the opposite problem. I could write anything if I just had the words, but learning the words is the hard part. So this uh, part of the lesson is meant to encourage you guys uh, to think about where the words come from in Esperanto and, and use that as a learning tool. It will help you to learn words faster or rather to commit them to memory uh, sooner. I'm talking about cognates. A cognate is a word between two languages that, that came from the same place. So there's a lot of cognates throughout European languages because these words may have come from Latin or Greek or what have you. Uh, and, and there's a lot of examples in, of this between natural languages, but Esperanto draws its vocabulary from these European languages as well. So being English speakers or any other European speakers in here, you have a advantage in that regard. Uh, and that's one you should take advantage of. So I'm going to put some words up on the board here and we'll call up volunteers. And I just want you guys to tell me what the corresponding word is in English. And when I say corresponding, it should also look and feel like the same word. But if you can't, if the best you can do is, is just what the word means, that's okay. Um, and please, feel free to draw on your knowledge from other languages as well if you speak something other than English. It's, it's meant to help you guys. But even in English, even in German, even in French, even in Polish, there are a lot of uh, vocabulary that overlaps, and you, and you can rely on that. So, 
Here's the first four words. Demandi, postuli, peti, regulo. So let's see, let's look for the first volunteer. Scabby, I'm si uh, Sebi, you have volunteered so many times. Sammy did earlier as well. I will let uh, Mi Forgesis the Accusativo go first, because I don't think that uh, she's gotten a chance to earlier. So, Accusativo, you are unmuted now. Give me Hi. your best guess, these words. So, all of them at once? Uh, yeah, just down the list, or as you can. Okay, so demandi is to ask, and I can kind of recall that from, like, Spanish. I think in Spanish it's, like, something along those lines, but I don't remember exactly what. That's fair. Uh, That's post good. Postuli? I, I remember uh, the word post, like postal. Um, but I don't know if that has anything to do with that. Fair enough. We'll put that down. I'll, I'll review it. Uh, how about Petty? Uh, Petty. Petty. So, I know it's an irregular verb. Not, sorry, not an irregular verb. Um, infinitive verb. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed, but, it is a verb. Yeah, it's an infinitive verb, but I, I'm not sure. Petas, like me petas. Yeah, yeah, me petas. I rec yeah, I, I, I recognize me petas, but I, I never really understood. That is okay. We it's can come back to that if you would like. Uh, but then regulo, do you have that one maybe? Yeah, that, that, that kind of sounds like regal. So I think kind of regulo, that might be rule or something along those lines. Okay. Rule is like a unit, right? Uh, say again. A rule is a unit. Well, uh, that's no, ulo, ulo, the oh the suffix? yes, actually that's that's a good point. Ul, uh, ulo is a suffix in Esperanto meaning a, a person uh, thereof. Actually, it doesn't have to be a person technically. It could be like well, another person. creature or a thing, but um, it. Uh, that's actually not a, a suffix there, though. The root is regul. I probably I should have uh, pointed that out, but but that's good that you brought that up anyway. So let's let's go over these. That was good. Thank you so much. Demandi is to ask or to question, uh, and I really like that you drew on on your knowledge of Spanish there because in English this is what would we we would call this a false cognate because it doesn't have to do with. Uh, with what you would expect, which is demand, right? So it looks like the word demand, but it doesn't have the English sense of demand. It has the, uh, the sense of to ask uh, a question, you know, question somebody. So that's a false friend in English, but in Spanish and, and perhaps French or what else have you, it, it, it makes more sense, right? So very good. Postuli is actually, uh, it's not post, it is uh, to request or, or demand something, but the corresponding English word is postulate, right? So not all of you know that word, and that's okay. If, if you know, it's, but if you did happen to, right, then that helps you. Or if you're learning about this for the first time and that fascinates you, maybe it will be easier to remember going forward. The word there is postulate. Whoops. Uh, petty. Someone might have guessed, like, to pet, like, you know, uh, like an animal, uh, and that wouldn't be right. It is uh, to ask for, to ask for something. So the nearest word in English would be petition. It's a petition somebody for something. And then last but not least, regulo means rule. Regal is something slightly different, I think. Um, there's a lot of these similar sounding words even in Latin itself. Regi... Whoops. Regi is to to control or to reign. Um, rego is king. I, I, I believe regal is, is more along those lines. Um, but regulo is a rule. And an even closer word would be regulation. All right. So thank you very much for your participation. That was good. I have uh, three more sections of this. So three more volunteers. Uh, or if we don't have enough, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll just go over it. But... So, Acusativo volunteered. Alchemisto. So, if there's anybody else. Alchemisto, you are unmuted. 
or you can unmute yourself, excuse me, and I will put up the next words for you. Okay. So let's see what you got for, whoops, for these words here. I think you made the same words as Friday. Probably. Or well, me. yeah, it's it's all the same words. <laughs> you can try it again though if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, party is to fair. Very good. Very good. Uh, pro many, I forgot. <laughs> That's okay. That's understandable. <laughs> it takes a couple times but, to get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Patsila is easy. That's right. Do you remember the uh, English word that resembles that? And if not, that's okay. Uh, I think you said it's not used anymore. It's facile. Uh, that's right. Kind of French or Portuguese, fácil. Right. You speak Portuguese and the word is similar there. So very good. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And then controle. Controle. I hated this word, but it's kind of to check something. Very good. You remembered that one, and I'm happy. So, <laughs> hey, yeah. it kind of tells me the class is working. He, he was here for for Friday. So, controli is a false friend, a false cognate. Uh, controli, excuse me, you would assume that it means control, but it means to check, to check in on something, or to check, uh, like, on a read back on something. So that's a false friend in English, but as someone pointed out to me, I, I believe it, it's... Uh, re, it's also uh, in Portuguese, a false it, friend. Okay, and the, but in German, it's it's it actually is control. So it's it's a false friend to English and Portuguese, probably romance in general. So uh, that's one to watch out for, but very good. Farti is fair. I said that one way earlier in class, but good on you for remembering it. Promeni means to walk or to stroll. So the nearest word is promenade, and that comes right out of French. I'm pretty sure for French has a similar word, so you probably recognize that one. Uh, you were absolutely right. Facile is an English word. I've never seen it before in my life. It's archaic as far as I'm concerned, but the word that we're going to be more familiar with is facilitate, which literally would be faciligi, to make easy or to make easier, right? So if you remember the word facilitate, facila. Very good, Alchemisto, thank you so much. See ya. All right, and then two more. I'll put up the next words. And don't forget to mute yourself uh, back. Uh, it's actually kind of weird, uh, the way to mute people in, in this kind of call, so, uh, without getting into it. So, who else would like to give it a try? Sami, I will let you give it a go. You are able to unmute yourself. Let's see if you can give us these four words here. Uh, uh, yep. to, uh, so, uh, able... Okay. All right. Good. Uh, uh, create, uh, create to, to think. Okay. Or uh, to believe. Oh no, no, uh, to create, to create. Yep. Very good. Yep. It's create. <laughs> now, pensy. <laughs> pensy uh, to think. Yep. That one's to think. Yep. Or to. And uh, hazarda. Um, uh, something that's dangerous. Okay. Uh, dangerous, hazardous, right? Okay, so those are good guesses. Ka yeah. Capable, able. That's good. Uh, capable also, uh, but, you know, same same idea there. That's good. Create is to create. That's right. Pensy is to think. The nearest word we have in English that I can think of is pensive, right? So pensive, if you're familiar with that word, it's to be... You know, lost in thought. The word in Esperanto for that would be uh, pensema or something. Hazarda is a false friend. That actually means accidental or random. 
Uh, random in in a figurative sense, but so that's another word that may be a false friend in 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 a given language. It's a false friend in English. It actually means accidental or or random. Although actually the closest thing, <laughs> I didn't think of this until now. We have haphazard. So haphazard is the is the closest word we have in English. That's kind of a false friend and kind of not. Uh, but very good. Very good guesses, by the way. One last section, and then class is over. And only seven minutes over so far. I, I consider that a win. Because <laughs> we got through actually everything we wanted to in this case. So definitely a win for me. Who will be our last volunteer today? For Desiri, Dubi, Rubo, and Actuala. All right, Sebi, you want to close us out? You've been here literally all three sessions, so I guess it's only fair you get to end us off. So, Sebi, I think you can unmute yourself. So, um, Desiri is to wish someone something. Okay, good. Or something. Uh, Dubi is to doubt. Yeah, good. Uh, a good cognate would be dubious. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Rubo means um, rubbish, mm -hmm. or waste, or trash, whatever. Yep. And ac actuala me doesn't mean actual; it means um, the current. Very good. You've Comes been down this road before. Actuell. Yep. So that's actually a, a good cognate in German, and and here in English it, that would be a false friend. In in Esperanto, actuala means current, like the current time. Um. I think English has remnants of this meaning of the word, uh, perhaps in actualize, or, or I think we do use the word actual in the archaic sense, but nowadays actual means like, you know, for real, genuine, verily, right? So that's a false friend here, but desiri is to wish, that is correct. Also desire, those, it, it doesn't not mean to desire, like that's that's a fair cognate to make, but wish is absolutely uh, a meaning it has as well. Dubious to doubt, and in case that wasn't convincing enough, dubious, very good. And rubo is rubbish. Now here's the thing, rubo looks like it could be a lot of things, uh, you know, uh, ruby, rubber, I mean, it's, it's, it happens a lot. Uh, so to guess that it's rubbish is, is a shot in the dark. Uh, but you knew that one, but uh, but once you've seen it once, you know, then it's easy to remember for the future. Guys, that is it. That is it. You made it to the end of Esperanto class, and I want to thank you all very much for being here today uh, at this at this early hour for some of you, um, and for for the rest of you. I'm glad I could provide this class at a, at a reasonable time for you, <laughs> you know, be it midday or what have you. Uh, but two and a half hours is a lot to ask of people. Two hours and 40 minutes even. Uh, but you guys made room uh, to be here today, and I really appreciate that. And I hope it was helpful. I hope you guys have uh, had a wonderful time here. I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope this helps you on your Esperanto journey. I know that some of you may... Uh, not be regular users of Discord even, that you may have uh, made a Discord account for the first time to be here. In which case, thank you so much for going to such lengths to be here. I certainly encourage all of you to stay here and be a part of our server if you aren't already. Uh, if you ever have any questions, you're welcome to ask folks in the Lerneo, which you can probably guess what that means now, having having attended this class. Uh, but that's our learning channel. We have a panel of Instruistoi, who are very good at what they do. They answer questions uh, as available. Um, and it's also many channels for discussions and for practice. Um, now is, is time for questions. So if you guys have places to be, or if you don't have any questions, don't want to hear other people's questions, yeah, whatever reason you have, uh, class is over now. Uh, and I thank you so much for being here. Uh, don't forget, though, I will be posting those links. Uh, and I'll pin that to this channel. So you can always come back later and, and check out uh, further reading. In fact, let me just go ahead and do that right now, and I'll pin it to the channel, uh, and it won't go anywhere. Let me see here. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I had a copy paste. No, I need good phrase books for Esperanto. That is a good question, actually. Phrase books. 
I bought like a uh, Berlitz Romanian phrasebook, and it had uh, some basic phrases and obviously a few chapters of stuff you get around, and then it had like a grammar section in the back, and I was wondering if there's like any pocket guides like that in Esperanto that you know of, or anything similar to the only one I know, that's a good question, the only one I know is, is pretty much the Fundamento de Esperanto, which I actually put a link to in, in that thing I just posted. Let me pin this really quick before I forget. Uh, the Fundamento is the third link there, and it, and it has an exercise book part, as well as a grammar part. Uh, of course, the grammar there is not as extensive, having been the foundation of the language, but the exercise section is pretty good from what I understand. Also, Gerda Malaperes is a very renowned beginner's book, uh, and it comes with a separate worksheet if, uh, if you were interested in tracking that down. It's, it's out there somewhere. Uh, so that's I never I knew it had a worksheet. I just remember buying the little pamphlet for Gerda Malaperis and it just yeah, yeah it, it didn't know came. how did you and Mato Kuyo learn the language? Mato if you want to jump in and answer first and I'll, I'll kind of uh, graze over the chat for a minute that's a fun question okay yeah we can take off um let's see uh I'm pretty sure I started just like some of you guys did um, if you guys have been interested in like linguistics or just languages in general, and you guys have been struggling with learning nat langs, um, natural languages, and you find it like, oh man, I don't know how to really get past this, or just like, man, this is taking a long time. Um, for me, I felt that at a certain point, and I was like, okay, I want to learn a language, and I like Esperanto, I like its ideas. Um, so I, that's how I started, but um, how did I learn it? Um, started with Duolingo. That was Uncut that for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that was there for a little while, for maybe about a month or two, and then you, I branched out to other resources because I had like basically a, a good fundamental in Esperanto, and then I could just build off of that. But I can tell you this right, hundred, like hundred percent right now. Um, Building your listening and your speaking is literally paramount to making sure that you can read and write better. So, uh, practice that and like talk to people in Esperanto often. Recommend coming here. That was good. My experience was largely the same. I, uh, I've had this this interest in language learning deep inside me this whole time. But I could hardly come to grips with it because <laughs> I took a class of German. I took German for a year in high school. And I also tried studying Japanese on my own. And there is an amazing guide out there. Uh, uh, tai Kim's Guide to Learning Japanese or, or something. I might have misremembered the name, and if so, I feel bad. But it's a free guide out there for any anybody looking to learn Japanese. So uh, these were very interesting to me both my German class and that course for Japanese, but I, I could never stick with them, you know? I, I And I had very little desire to learn any other languages. Um, I tried Russian on Duolingo for a good week <laughs> or so, and it was really overwhelming. So, yeah, it's, it's daunting to learn a natural language. And then I heard of Esperanto, and I couldn't keep my eyes off it. I mean, at first I told myself I was learning it to see what it was all about you know it couldn't be real right if people aren't actually speaking this how could that be but it didn't take me long for me to just fall in love with the language just straight up turns out there's a whole community behind it you, yeah. you don't learn the language you learn the community <laughs> exactly well and it's funny you mentioned that because that's also something that has has bothered me about natural languages you can't learn japanese without getting deep into japanese culture you can't learn uh you know, French without getting uh, at least somewhere immersive, you know, some kind of immersion in French. And I have no real desire or, or uh, expectation of, of moving to any of these countries. Not that I think it would be a bad idea, I just, I, I don't foresee that. I could certainly learn a language if I knew I was going to be where it's spoken. Now, Esperanto has a community, uh, and it's of 
rather like-minded people for everybody to end up in the same place. So that's kind of cool. I was wary about that at first, though, because I still, I don't really want to learn the culture. I want to learn the language. But with Esperanto, you can do just that. You know, you, you can. It's possible. Uh, and it's all regular and stuff. So, uh, And now that I've learned Esperanto, now I feel more prepared if I ever do learn another natural language. Because this has introduced me to so many grammar concepts that are often overlooked for uh, natural languages. Now, the best way to learn a natural language is always immersion. Yeah, you, you don't really want to be thinking always, your way through always. the grammar. Yeah, so yeah, you got to be thinking as much in that language as much as possible. If you can, start speaking the language from day one. Absolutely. But on the same hand, I feel like instructors of natural languages use that as an excuse um, to you know, skip over the, the basic grammar parts that might be, might be more helpful, right? So. Uh, oh yeah, of, of course. It's, it's, have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule? I have, uh, but I don't remember it. Feel free to. <laughs> yeah, so like uh, 80% of your learning comes just from like 20% of what you do, like what you learn. But like that other 80% still accounts for that 20% of what you know. Right. So very few things are going to pick up along the way, but it's it'll stack up. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's uh, so. I hope that answered uh, Nausicaa's question as for uh, how how did we learn the language. Also, uh, how was that the question? How did also how uh, to answer the part of how did we go about it? Um, I didn't. I, I started with Duolingo and I, that bored me. I just I didn't do it for very long. I actually studied the grammar really thoroughly. I started on Wikipedia, then Lernu.net's grammar reference is the best. It is the best, most authoritative uh, grammar description of Esperanto written in anything other than Esperanto. I couldn't recommend it enough. That's why it's number two on the links that I just pinned to the channel. Um, I studied the grammar a lot, and then I just practiced here, just right away, as soon as I could. I started having conversations here, and I had a dictionary on hand at all times. Like I said, the thing about Esperanto is that if you get the grammar out of the way, you can form any sentence you want by just looking up all the words. And I, and I really believe in leveraging that because you can't say the same of natural languages. That's unique about Esperanto. If you don't want to do in it that Esperanto, way, it's fine. Esperanto, you get to yeah. actually practice the stuff you need to in those other right. languages. That's what I like about Esperanto. Exactly. So that's how I went about it. I didn't do courses. I hate memory flashcards because I... I'm impatient and I don't stick with them very well. But I know some people love them. So Anki, Memrise, I know there's these websites that do flashcards. Uh, fantastic. You know, if, the, if there's, there's good Esperanto decks out there. But what I do is I just practice and I have a dictionary on hand. I promise it's not cheating. I promise it's not cheating. You, you, you'll think to yourself, how am I going to remember anything when I'm always looking it up? I'll tell you how. By the fifth or sixth because time... because you're actually using it. Well, not only that. I mean, that's true. It, it, it introduces you to the vocabulary that you'll need right away. But by the fifth or sixth time you've looked up a word, you're going to get sick of it. And you're going to be like, all right, I need to remember this word so I don't have to keep looking it up. That has been shockingly effective for me personally. So now the, Yeah, the, especially Especially writing down each word that you actually look up to keep track of, like a, like keep a log of the words that you look up. So if you if you notice that you have a lot of patterns, just say, okay, I need to actually memorize this. Yeah. Now the the offhand of that is the way I learned means that I don't know enough mm. words that I don't see that often. And so it took me a long time to learn, yeah, like, the basic furniture in a room. Like, uh, a seat would be a sejo, like a chair. And a uh, room is, mm. is chambro. And that took me uh, an embarrassingly long time to learn what seems like basic words. Even the names of animals, like katohundo, those are easy because I recognize those. But, like, strigo, owl, uh, mm. gufo or, uh, is another kind of owl. Gufo kind of stood out to me, I suppose, but Strigo, very difficult. Araneo for 
spider. I could only remember that because of the word arachnid, and even then it's a hard... Yeah, same. Yeah. Abello is me, I think. Yeah. I mean, if you're learning a language, you gotta learn stuff that is actually appealing to you, so that you can actually go out and use it in that field and try to pick up some vocabulary naturally over there. Because that's what it's about, natural erosion. Yeah. I guess. That's, that's a good... So, um, I saw another good question in here. Um, Marokuyo answered it, uh, essentially, but Diakitoi asks, can affixes be used with adverbs or uh, correlatives? Uh, when you say affixes... First of all, yes. Um, you know, like, you know, you know, a, il, uh, aj. I mean, there's all these, there's all these uh, affixes that we covered in class. You can use those with adverbs all the same. Um, even the adverbs that don't end in e, like uh, hodia, for example. You could set, you could add an ending there if you wanted to. Um, la hodiawa curso, the today course, right? Um, with correlatives, however, it's a little bit different. The correlatives, you can't add um, just any suffixes, or, or prefixes for that matter. But with the correlatives, there are cases where you actually can add a, a part of speech marker. And I don't want to call that irregular, but unexpected is, is, is a fair word. So, kial is the word for why. Tial would be therefore or for that reason. Ial is some reason. Chial is uh, for every reason. Nenial is no reason. So, uh, given that, you can actually we have this word kialo for reason. We also have the word rezono, but that has to do with reasoning, like uh, like in a debate or like a logical uh, succession. Kialo is is every other use of, of reason, and I don't know. This is kind of weird to me, but it's 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 how it be, you know. And you can you, there's a couple of these words that you add an ending. The other interesting example is with the amounts. So kiom is how much or how many, and tiom is is. Uh, you know that amount. Eom is uh, a bit, or, or excuse me, some, some amount or some. Chiom is like all, all of. Neniom is none. Uh, what, what time is it? Which hour is it? The word which in that situation becomes kioma. Which is usually kiyu. Like, like, which this and that. Uh, you know, kiyutago, uh, ye kiyutago okazos la curso, on which day will, will the uh, course occur. But when you have a, yeah. a sequence, we have this kioma, witcheth. Well, it's more like, no, it's, it's basically the same as kiom da, it's just a more emphatic form, like how, like how you would say, uh, kiom da, uh, kioma horo. Kiyomahoro is like, like, but like, which hour, though? Uh, well, I guess you could say that's kind of like how yeah, many of hours, yeah. Yeah, it's just a more emphatic version of Kiyomda. It's the same thing, though. It may it may follow about the same, but it's it's definitely not a literal... Uh, you, you couldn't do this, so the best we can do is this. So if, if that answers uh, um, Diakritoi's question. But yeah, yeah. So absolutely. wait, it's like... You're making kiom an adjective. Yes, that's essentially what's happening there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and then Sebi pointed out kialo reason. So there's a couple of correlatives where that where that makes sense. So not all of them are. You know, does it make as much sense, right? But uh, let's see what other. Oh, uh, somebody asked about um, la plena illustrita Vortaro. Marocuyo answered most of those questions, but uh, Vortaro.net is the online version of Pivo. Uh, there is a printed version, but I believe it's out of print. Uh, in fact, the bad news, as far as I can tell, is it's going to be very hard to get a, 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 a hand on a copy of that. Uh, PIV 2020 was the last edition that was to be printed in paper. 
Uh, now all of the updates are going to go on the website. Now, according to something I read yesterday, they are supposed to be adding a feature to the website that's like print on demand. So you can just print whatever the current state of the dictionary is uh, on demand. But w when it's print on demand, I don't know if it means it gives you a PDF and you print it yourself, because that's got to be a lot of pages, or if they will make a print for you and send it to you. I don't know which that would be. Um, but for sure, uh, you could probably pick up secondhand copies since it just came out, and the online version is always available for free, and it's very good. So, uh, you know, Pivo is, is the dictionary, but it's all in Esperanto, so you, <laughs> you have to make it that far, right? That's, that's what you're working towards. Let's see. Uh, well, if you have a little English or whatever your native language is, uh, just have like a two-way dictionary for your dictionary and try to just understand it from the one uh, just in Esperanto. Yeah, no, that's what I have an issue with. Uh, I've definitely had my fair share experiences. I'm pretty sure everyone else has of doing a... If you are like past basic, trying to look up in a dictionary um, in its own native language. Like, oh yeah, like, oh yeah, you forgot this word and then you try to look it up in that native words dictionary yeah it's a pain i don't recommend doing a two-way um dictionary if you have to use something like that what i do recommend especially if it's something like vortado uh do your best to learn as much esperanto as you can it's a really good way of getting of getting your reading up in esperanto but oh my goodness you will struggle if you decide to do it too early <laughs> I will, I will give a caveat to that. I have uh, two dictionaries side by side. I have Vortado. Whoops, spilled some water. And I have Tuya Vortado. I, I don't share Tuya Vortado with beginners because it's actually quite error prone. It's the most convenient. Uh, Tuya means immediate. Uh, it's, it's very convenient. But it's, it, it makes a lot of errors. And it, it gave me a lot of hell when I was a beginner and misinstructed me about a lot of words. But now that I can see through those, I have it. But I only yeah. do that for certain kinds of words. I, I, I mostly go straight to Vortado.net, as, as Marokuyo said. But occasionally I'll, I'll give myself a break for something like an animal name. Because the Vortado definition is going to be all... Uh, sciency, and I just I wouldn't describe a beaver by its features. I, I have to know the word beaver. So, uh, but in general, you can avoid that. Big uh, plump, uh, buck tooth, furry animal. That, that's that's my best shot. Oh, for a beaver. Okay. Alright, jeez, I, I have to go. Jeez, <laughs> amigo. Any other questions? I, I, there's, I'm still scanning in, in case we, uh, in case we missed some so far. I imagine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Be and uh, wait, what was the thing I was gonna ask? I was talking about the two dictionaries and how we like to avoid. Oh yeah, the two of what Yeah, yeah it's really messed up because uh, it's based off of a whole other source. Um, it's not based off of the Plena Ilustrata Vortado. It's based off a old um early esperanto dictionary that was um influenced by a early french esperanto speaker and he added quite a bit of french um uh french words into the into his dictionary so of course it's going to be a lot more odd and some of the in entries aren't were not exactly agreed upon by a lot of people that's why it's very odd mostly mostly okay and all right if you know what not to choose yeah, no, that's absolutely... And I was reading yesterday, like, what a coincidence, I just happened to be reading it yesterday, about how um, the earliest versions of Peevil were also really uh, French-influenced. And that's not, like, the end of the world, but this language doesn't belong to, to anyone or any culture. So, English speakers, we have to make an effort to not bring all our Anglicisms uh, into... Esperanto, and uh, and we have a similar thing with with French, for example. There, there's a lot of French Esperantists. French, France is a, is a hot spot certainly for Esperanto, 
uh, b- but they have to be careful about about some things that, that they would take for granted as, as native French speakers. And some of those things made its way into several of the earliest dictionaries. Pivo is, is very clean now. Uh, but even besides that, Tuya will just straight up lie about like whether a verb is transitive or not, or... Uh, it has there's some words that are missing that really shouldn't be uh, i know that they'll never get it 100 percent, but like come on uh there's there's a lot of esperanto slang and history that's missing and then there's other ones that are misdefined echo shanjo is is a funny uh mnemonic that we have mnemonic might not be the right word but we use it to demonstrate all the hat letters and it defines it as a as a phrase that has all the letters in a language well that's not quite right it has all the hat letters but (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) so weird errors like that also uh there's another question i I should probably uh, i should probably answer yeah go for Um, it so comey asks uh, thoughts on archaicum esperantum um Mm. Well, well you... I've read I've read the introduction on the PDF of the um of the of the man's work. I forgot his name unfortunately. Um and I've read in some into it because I really like it. Personally for me, just very pleasing. Um it's just a really nice thing. And uh if you what any for anybody who doesn't know, Arakankum Esperantum is basically a constructed language of a constructed language. The point of it is to make Esperanto look more archaic, for the mainly the purpose of literary, like um, in literary immersion. So if you were to make something sound more oldy, or more like oh far away type stuff, um, you would definitely use this as a more of a literature, um, a, a literary aid, um, instead of another international besides like also it's like very latin influenced and somewhat german old german influenced you can definitely see that if you look at it yeah marocco is the expert on archaic um, i looked at it a little bit there's a there's a wikipedia page for those who don't know um there's an esperanto wikipedia and it's actually pretty nice it a lot of articles might be of of lesser quality uh, they get less scrutiny but there are a surprising number of pages and there's a really good one on Archaicum Esperantum but that's not the end of the story like even if you look there there's like a whole book um, yeah. and I haven't seen recommend, that yet recommend looking the uh, book <laughs> yeah. I'll see if I can drop you a, a link for a download or something it's not really it's 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 quite a bit but the thing is it's literally all dedicated to it it's just dedicated for it, self-learning on it it's really good um, also, there's another one I might want to answer. Yeah, yeah, you know, go more for it. With um, French being more of an international language back then. Um, yes, yes, uh, especially during times of early 1900s, the U, the League of Nations legit uh, had French as that one language of court per se. Of um, sure, there's English and there's German and there's all these other nations in there, but French was the thing that everyone was expected to speak if that puts it um french into perspective um of how powerful and how popular french was back then now the ties have shifted politically and america with um, its political dominance took over the scene after world war ii and because of the cold war and everything now english is the most dominant language you can tell it's really annoying and uh (laughs) But just quick little and just quick little antidote. Esperanto was actually proposed um, as uh, as a uh, as a language to be spoken into the League of Nations. It was that popular. It was getting to that point. Unfortunately, France didn't like that, and uh, because they wanted people to speak French, because that also includes French culture, they'd be more sympathetic to French people, that kind of thing. Um, and if you're wondering why the United Nations doesn't do Esperanto, well, you can blame America for that. Because they do an exact same thing. It's linguistic dominance. And United Nations is an interesting case because the UN has, uh, at two different times, vindicated Esperanto. In 19... Okay, the mid-20th century. I don't remember exactly. 50s, 60s, maybe. They officially declared Esperanto an international auxiliary language. They didn't say the... 
And I think that's appropriate, because if we really deserve to be the international auxiliary language, then you know we should be able to beat out uh, whatever other uh, conlangs that they that may be proposed. I'm all in on it being a conlang. I actually don't care what it is. I would speak Volapük as long as it was made up. <laughs> I'm all in on that. Um, but they did declare Esperanto uh, in an official capacity, uh, not necessarily for their own business or affairs, but just, you know, they, they acknowledge its existence. Later in the 1980s, they made another declaration, and they said all member nations ought to begin teaching Esperanto in schools. Most nations did not... Uh, respond to that in the slightest. However, Brazil did. In 20... Uh, let's see, 2007, 9, 13... I think it was 2009. Uh, Brazil uh, actually passed a bill uh, that elementary schools in Brazil should offer Esperanto uh, as, as, a, as a course. Uh, as for how mandatory it was, it was basically, you don't have to offer it until somebody asks. But if somebody says they would like Esperanto, you're required to uh, uh, provide it. Now, what I don't know is if it passed all the way. Yeah, I, think it, I think it made it through some chambers, uh, but maybe, it, I, think, I think the Senate passed it, but that's not to say that it became law. So I'm not sure what came of that. Um, but the history of, of Esperanto acceptance is interesting in, in and of itself. Brazil is the uh, second... Uh, how should I put this? Zamenhof being from Poland. Poland has probably the most uh, tributes to Zamenhof of any country, followed by Brazil. Uh, so it's it, it was quite popular there. It's, it's fun to give out that trivia. I didn't want to spend too much time in the class, you know, going... You know, I just did the important parts of the history, but I, I like getting those opportunities to, to say that. Uh, let's see. And there's Other another questions? one. That, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I think it was by Sammy. Uh, I'm just double-checking. Yeah. Uh, how can I convince my friend to learn Esperanto? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun one, yeah. You want to take a crack? Well, you it? actually no. You probably have more experience with it. You've, oh, okay. you've actually been successful. I came off as apparently cultish <laughs> when I tried to do it to any of them I know. So you know, maybe you're right because I actually have had pretty good success convincing people um, to at least appreciate Esperanto. I haven't convinced too many people to learn it yet. Um, I didn't make a note of this earlier um, because she said she didn't want to uh, participate. She's in a coffee shop, but my mother actually attended this course today. She was in here. I, I, I see she's gone now, but uh, <laughs> so that's really cool, you know, <laughs> being able to get your family in on it because most people I've talked to, they say that they were ridiculed by their friends and family for speaking a, a not real language. And um, I, I think the best way to combat that is to be very forthcoming about what Esperanto is and is not. Uh, I always present it as a hobby of mine. And I am very serious that I would like the world to speak Esperanto, but you have to like it for what it is. And when I present it to people the first time, I, I, I simply present it as a thing that I'm choosing to do. Because you know, no one can disabuse you for that. Um, and I'm also very honest that it's made up, and and that's like a water cooler conversation. That's a that's an icebreaker to me, uh, is that it's made up. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just get that right out of the way, and then I'll talk about how real it is. And they're like, oh wow, <laughs> yeah, two million speakers. For, <laughs> <laughs> but as for me though, like, uh, I guess not. I think about it. I may have done it like a business sales pitch, where I present a problem. And I provide that Esperanto will be the solution to that problem. <laughs> With, uh, unfortunately, has not worked. But I don't know what other way to go about it. Is saying like, oh yeah, man, like Esperanto is this and that. This is a slight history. Um, and then presenting the problem of like, well, Zamenhof wanted this and that, and you know, the world is like this, and uh, it's most likely. I presented to them like, oh yeah, language barrier and culture barrier is a big issue. So Esperanto fixes that. Well, at least tries his best to. And here's uh, why that it's probably a really great thing. Unfortunately, it's falls on deaf ears half the time because you know, number one, kind of have to be interested in languages. Apparently, <laughs> apparently, uh, it's not popular. <laughs> it's not 
it's not I don't know what I'm gonna say. Um, useful is not the word. It's not as demanding to learn because there isn't as many obvious speakers around unless you look for them. Right, like there there is no shortage of things to do in Esperanto, but you do have to go out of your way and look for those resources. You will never be traveling abroad and have a, an errant need to speak Esperanto. Now, I say never. Um, I'm sure it's not literally never. There's actually a book uh, written around the golden age of, of Esperanto, and uh, that was... Not exactly a plot point, but one of the scenes was, uh, you know, the main character became acquainted with Esperanto. That's kind of like a side thing, really. And then he was at a church one time at a, at a service, and uh, they were uh, speaking to a large audience of diverse people. And, and so they were like, we need a translator that can either speak German, Polish... Swedish or Esperanto or something, and the guy's like, I speak Esperanto, like, <laughs> you know, one in a million, right? That doesn't, especially now, that doesn't really happen, but, um, but we do have the Pasporta Servo. Um, for those who don't know, there's a, f a service, it's a gift service, that is to say, it's, it's free, it's done out of the kindness of people's hearts. Uh, you can sign up to be a host. Uh, for other Esperantists traveling abroad, and, and you can host folks in your home uh, for whatever time, whatever reason, and you, you got to get with them on it, but you can, you can seek these opportunities out to make Esperanto useful. And by host, for those who aren't too familiar with English, he means for them to come over to your house and then stay for a certain period of time, and or vice versa, where you go over to their house. <laughs> there's a lot in France by the way there's a lot yeah. in Western Europe there's a couple in the Middle East there's quite a bit in China by the way China's actually kind of one of the hot spots for Esperanza mm -hmm. yeah, if you didn't know there's a couple in Japan and there's a fair amount in the US but it's, it's definitely concentrated on all the cities yeah definitely concentrated on Europe like for even like, like I'm just saying if you look in the website and see all the dots where everyone has it. France is literally just littered. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. Let's see. France, and, and we said earlier, France is a hot spot. Uh, funny enough, the, the UEA, the Universala Esperanto Asocio, uh, the, the, they're the big boys, right? They're the biggest international association in the world for Esperanto. And they also... Um, host the Academio, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and it's a paid membership to, to be a part of the UEA, but Germany gets uh, the honor of having the most UEA memberships, <laughs> so very European concentrated. Yeah. Um, what are some ways you can meet other Esperantists in your country? Um, it depends on the country, but typically... I'd recommend looking on some forums or something like that. Um, Duolingo actually has something really interesting where they've done this for a little bit now, where they would have these meetups. Um, and basically, like, I guess, it's not, I'm going to be honest, it's not really to talk Esperanto, it's to learn Esperanto with other people. That's as close as I can get for this. Uh, some, I mean, Esperanto is to the point right now, they're like, if somebody isn't Esperanto and they're going to these meetings, they're most likely not going to be a beginner. <laughs> So you can have, like, actual legit conversations with people. Besides that, I don't know any other sites or, like, trusted stuff that, like, you can just straight up try to meet people, try to meet people physically. Uh, the only other one is Amikumu, which Charoslava pointed out. Amikumu is an app uh, co-founded by Esperantists, by the way. The, the name is, um, Amiko is, is friend. Um is a suffix that we didn't talk about in class. It's it's a kind of like how ye yeah is a indefinite pr preposition. Um is an indefinite uh, uh, suffix, but it basically means go make friends. You know that's the name of the app, and it's uh, it doesn't work for just Esperanto. You can meet people of, of any language near you. Uh, Esperanto is certainly supported, but that also really depends on where you live. I mean, the sad truth is for a lot of us. We don't live near that many Esperantists, so, you know, it might be unfortunate news. But, on the other hand, maybe not all of them just use Amikumu, right? Maybe they're there, but you got to find them another way, so... The only thing I could suggest is if you got any big cities in your country, um, that's probably one of the best places to look. 
Yeah, absolutely agreed. Uh, the other, let's see, the UEA is is worldwide. I don't know what the status is of them having like chapters per country. I don't know if that's a thing exactly, but there's also Esperanto USA. That's a United States organization for Esperanto. I'm sure several countries have their own equivalents. I know that Esperanto USA um, has like regional contact points like you can email somebody for a given uh metro area or, or a given group of states and you could try to arrange meetups that way or at least learn who is out there so um but again not every region has so many but that's another thing you could try okay uh, let's see Is Props there any other saying. questions that we'd like to ask? Or? Yeah, did we miss any? Because there's there's a lot of messages here, so we might have skipped one, and that's not intentional. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you guys have any new like messages or messages, I mean, like questions that you send but you haven't got answered, yeah, mm -hmm. just send them right now. Don't mind. I have to go to create an Esperanto community in Tunisia. Oh, the, um, for Sami, uh, yes, um, I am actually learning Arabic, so I can definitely see the need for Middle Eastern countries or Middle Eastern, to be honest, Arabs and Middle Eastern people in general to just have any knowledge on Esperanto whatsoever because there is next to none over there. It is all MSA and like, I'm going to be honest, it really needs to be an easier alternative than having to learn near Quranic update, updated Quranic Arabic. <laughs> Absolutely. And I don't know as much about that, but I do know that there's communities, some of which I don't even know about, that just really, there's there's so many languages out there that they could use any one of them to unite. They have a real need Arabic for is it. really bad. Yeah. Arabic is really bad about it. You get, I know yeah. country, the countries aren't that large, but you go to one city and then to another. I'll talk about Lebanon. I'll complain about Lebanon all day when it comes to this. You go to one village and then you go to Beirut or something. Yeah, good luck. You ain't um, you ain't understanding too many. Yeah, you can get a basic amount, but like, it's noticeably different, a lot of especially when variation. it comes to Beirut. Like, there's a lot of French in that, and then probably some French and Lebanese. But like, I mean, come on, now. you can <laughs> you can get confused really easily <laughs> if you're like from Jordan and you go to someone in Lebanon. But that's just me. Yeah. But um, um there there's a question by Comey. Uh, yeah, no, what, is, what the is the best, best literature movie? originally written in Esperanto? Uh, do you have one in mind, Mato? Because I don't have one specific um, word. Yes, but... I do. It's called the Cresto Matio. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I haven't read the it fundamenta, yet. The Fundamenta Cresto Matio. Um, it's literally free. I'll just post it in here. It's long, by the way, but it, that's a great thing that it's long. It's free, it's in public domain. Right, yeah, no shortage um, of things to read. And in, um, in English, this would what would be called a crestomathy. A crestomathy is a book that is used that is has a collection of stories, ways of using a constructed language, and well, and the stories in the constructed language, of course, in order to show how the constructed language it works. This is Esperanto's crestomathy. Made, of course, by Simon Hoff and collected stories. Not all, not everything in here was by Simon Hoff. He's collected other stories of people who have translated and who have originally made other stuff like there's a lot of uh, anecdotes which are these little um little cute funny stories uh, a lot of these were originally in esperanto there's some literature in the back that's made that was translated there's uh, quite a few stuff in the center that's original so uh, this has this, uh, this is a bunch of collection of works some original some not this this is definitely a good place to start I second that. It's I, I've heard a lot about it. I know it's famed, and I, I did go and find a copy of it. I just hadn't started reading, but it's, it's so long, and it's good. Uh, also, I want to point you to Cloud Piron. I don't know if I pronounced that right because you know French, but um, let me just reply. Author Cloud Piron. Piron. Uh, Cloud Piron is arguably the most prolific author in Esperanto's history, especially among those who, as far as I can tell, weren't involved with the uh, Academio or, or, or the creation of it. Because he came later, right? He, he wasn't during Zamenhof's time. Um, 
I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he was never an Academiano or such. He was just that good and well-known of an author. And he, he wrote a lot of stuff. I'm sure some of it was translated. Um, but any works from Piron are you know, top-notch. You can't go wrong. And a lot of them are certainly original stories. Oh, um, cool. I was searching here about the law in Brazil to allow Esperanto to be taught. Yeah. And the newest one I saw was from 2016. So already five years. Okay. And I s the problems are that in the law it says that it has been international language. And since Esperanto is not from a country, it's not international, quotation marks. So that I, what, changed wait, its part. So the law requires it to be from a country? Yeah, the way it's written uh, currently says that it has to be from somewhere. The language. <laughs> Well, I mean, she's in Poland. <laughs> you just call I mean, that. yeah, technically, like, yeah, yeah okay, let's go yeah. Poland. <laughs> That's an easy workaround, but okay, yeah, and I mean, you know, never trust the uh, government part officials. Is that to teach a language in Brazil, you have to have a diploma, like from university. Kind of right. Like, uh, to teach English have to go to university and study Portuguese and English but there isn't a major for Esperanto so does that it have to be recognized I'm thinking about it Academia can just print you out a certificate <laughs> that actually guarantees that I'm just saying well through, as, as far as the world is concerned that's actually a good point and that's one of the for sure uh, barriers to Esperanto acceptance is that it's difficult to judge uh, fluency. Now, there is one renowned fluency test. It, it is made in collaboration with the UEA, uh, and it's and it's distributed by some Hungarian university, actually. And I don't remember the name. I could I could get that for you guys, but they they host this every year and they they work on this fluency test, and it's very professional. It's very good. It's very good stuff. Um, and I, I, perhaps you could go to Hungary and, and attend this university, and I think they teach courses as well. But even then, I don't know if that's a major exactly. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's up in the air how one would accept the, uh, that fluency test. You know, that, that really helps you get into uh, the UEA and Esperanto institutions, but it doesn't help you convince your government that you can teach Esperanto. So that's a, f I mean, it's it's lamentable, but I understand. Yeah, especially here in Brazil, we have basically two kinds of major. One that's the teaching major, and the other is the, okay, you can go to work major, like, everywhere but a school, and they mm. require the teaching major. Mm. Yeah. In Esperanto, so you can teach Esperanto in schools. So, well, thank you for finding that out for us, though, because I, 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 you know, certainly don't let me speak on behalf of Brazil. I remember reading that sometime about it being proposed and and maybe looked on favorably by the Senate at the time, but I, from from what I know, it didn't end up uh, passing all the way. So, you know, that's understandable. Yeah. It has been approved, I think, by the Senate, and still needs to be approved on the second mm. place. I forgot yeah. the name in English, sorry. The, the, well, we have the house. I don't know if it's called the house in yeah. Portuguese. Okay. And just to finish, in the text of the new law, the author wrote, not only Esperanto is a language, it's also a symbol of peace. <laughs> well, we can't have that in our schools, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Mm. Well, very well, though. Uh, are there any more questions? I, I think the I think the questions are kind of slowing down. A after all, you guys are also welcome to ask at any time in the Lerneo. Um, but if that's it, I think I'm going to uh, let us close up shop now, let everyone go home, yeah. do their things. <laughs> and just one more thing, actually. Yeah, uh, no, go I for it. I to send that one poem excerpt. This is, I found a book, by the way, but I already typed this out like a long while back. This is like the first poem from, let's see, uh, it's just uh, Mikhail Lermontov, Elektita Verso. It's just uh, chosen verses from Mikhail Lermontov. By the way, Mikhail Lermontov, Mikhail Lermontov, like, even in English, it is stuff. He's one of the greatest poets I've ever read. So that actually looks really fun. Yeah, I don't think I've seen yes, that. Yes, um, yeah, this is how advanced Esperanto. Okay, this is translated apparently by somebody from the um, World World uh, Assembly Association, uh, the Monda Assemblo Asocia. This is how advanced Esperanto could get in poetry. Oh my gosh, these guys are great. <laughs> <laughs> High level Esperanto is is so cool. Just you just you know when you're there, right? And it's it's amazing. But I'm um, glad you found that. Yeah. Uh, oh, we do have another question. Have you ever had any experiences where the only language you had in common with someone was Esperanto? Me personally, nope. I can't say I have, but. What I can say is, in this server, we have plenty of individuals whose Esperanto is way stronger than their English. Um, in which case, it's it's more convenient to speak in Esperanto. And that's always... Like, I, I usually present it as a hobby and not as, like, a selling point. Uh, Esperanto, I mean, I, I don't try to sell it to people. But when I do, what I think is the most convincing thing is that it's harder for someone halfway across the world to learn your language and then you both try to understand each other even though you have put in zero work that is still more difficult than you both learning Esperanto for a year and using that I, I am very firm on that I believe Esperanto makes that easier so uh, and throughout Europe in Esperanto's golden age there absolutely were a couple of situations where you know, maybe two people meet up and they're only uh, shared language is Esperanto, and then they and then they have kids, and that's where we get our thousand or so native speakers from. <laughs> so it, yeah. it does happen. <laughs> Fortunately, I will teach it to any of my kids, but also unfortunately, apparently, um, I cannot teach it to any of my nephews. They rather me do Arabic, which is unfortunate. I mean, Arabic is still cool. They'll make money that way. <laughs> yeah, I guess they'll make money that way. Yeah. Get a blind Esperanto, but no. <laughs> Gotta learn Spanish. Oh, even though nobody God. here speaks Spanish. And even though they don't even go to their relatives who speak Spanish. No. I can't do that. I can't teach him something useful. That's a, that's ridiculous. There there was a study done. I just want to throw this out there. There was a study done. It's not terribly conclusive. It's not... Uh, uh, it's not spared from criticism. Uh, you know, I'm not a scientist. I haven't reviewed the method. But a study showed that th there were two groups of students. Group A learned Esperanto for six months and then French for 18 months. So half a year of Esperanto, year and a half of, of French. Group B learned French for 24 months, for all two years, didn't touch Esperanto. And they found that Group A performed French better, even though they spent less time studying French because of the time they spent studying Esperanto. So again, you know, I, first of all, I would need to find the source on that. Um, I, I know it happened, but I don't remember the Heard paper. Heard that before, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that makes a very convincing case that even if you want to learn a native language and Esperanto seems dumb, uh, that's a good first uh, other language to learn. I mean, it has its benefits. Yeah. Cool beans. Uh, ba -ba. Let's see. Uh, let's see down there. Uh, let me answer this, Sammy. It's uh, indeed the easiest um, to learn. Um, nope. Uh, I would definitely disagree with you that it's the easiest to learn. Um, I would only say it only depends on what your native language is and how comfortable you are with uh, speaking Arabic at, at all. 
um, because one dialect may be easier for one person than it is for another. For me personally, I like the sound of Darija a lot, which is like a North African uh, variety of Arabic, very influenced by, um, let's see, like later Saudi, like uh, later Saudi um, Arabic because of the, um, when they took over the areas. And obviously with Tifinacht, I'm not, I do not like the word Berber, by the way, just say Tifinacht. And um, some French, obviously, some Spanish if you're from Morocco. So it's a very interesting amalgamation of all that, but it's awesome. It's just saying. <laughs> um, I, would, I definitely go with the stereotype, though, that everyone calls it the softest Arabic because it just sounds nice. I mean, <laughs> the word for cute is mahdoum. Like that's, if that doesn't sound nice, I don't know. That's a charming word. I like that. <laughs> Honestly, though, it's crazy, because there's some languages that have a reputation for sounding angry. People say that about German all the time. I took German, and I couldn't be further from the truth. I think most languages have an inherent uh, uh, beauty to them. It all comes down to taste. I think Esperanto sounds uh, beautiful, and some people are like, let's be honest, it's not. <laughs> like, I'm not making the... <laughs> I genuinely like it, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, hey, sounds like like um, bootleg Italian. Who doesn't love that? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just getting um personal uh, questions, which is still good, but yeah, I think is at this point it's. Oh yeah. Time. No, I ain't got but... nothing else much to do. Like, <laughs> I'm probably just gonna play chivalry a bit and um. Let's see, take my wife to work. She needs to, yeah, she needs to get up. Um, that and just uh, do homework later, but I'm going to relax first, man. I got you. Yeah, Mato Kuyo and, and Mai's DMs are always open. Well, I can't speak for Mato. I, I assume so. <laughs> yeah, they're uh, open. I'll just respond late. Yeah, yeah. You can always hit us up if you have if you have questions for us specifically. If you want to ask Mato more about, more about Arabic or if you want to ask me more about... Uh, you can ask either of us about Esperanto and... And I don't know what my specialty would be. Vo voice acting, I guess. I, yeah, I do some. Or, or if you have any general questions. Oh, sorry, what? Uh, I would like amateur one too, so I can go for it. Yeah. If you have any general questions about the language still, let it know. That's, that's our learning channel. You are always welcome there. Uh, it might be one of us responding. It might be one of the other. Instristoi. Anybody with the role Instristo is credible you know is, is generally good at the language so very good uh, somebody asks what was the topic today uh if you just showed up we just had our our crash course to esperanto for uh, english speakers um and it doesn't have to be native english speakers in fact today we had a lot of folks from uh, south america from europe etc uh because this the timing worked out better for them today in the morning and that's really cool actually I, I was we had about as many people today as we did yesterday i was not expecting that at all i'm super thrilled uh it's actually over we're just we're just wrapping up now but i have recorded this lesson and anybody that couldn't attend uh you know will we'll get a chance to see the course through that uh if you just showed up and you missed the course you didn't mean to DM me and I can give you a copy. Uh, it might take me some time to like clip it together because uh, I wanted to add a part from s uh, Saturday's course as well. But uh, that's all I've got, though, guys. Yeah. And uh, oh yeah, just one last question. Apparently, just came up, and yeah, this okay. will be the last one. For the, the very last thing. one. <laughs> yeah. Um. Sammy asks, "How do you Esperantize names?" Okay. So um. There are mainly, from what I've researched, there are mainly three ways, and I'll show you the source that I've used for this in reference. Um, it's sort of contested, and it, it's like up to the... I'll let you know, guys, right now, that it's up to you guys, up to the speaker, how you guys want to do it. There's no official way of doing this. Um, so there is just leaving it as it is, which is fine. Um, there is, I'm sure you know, Code already went over, I'll just go in more detail. Yeah, uh, go for it. Leaving as it is, there is um, Esperantizing it, um, straight up for not phonetically, and just putting uh, the, where es Esperanto equivalents to the original um, 
to as close to the original uh, name as possible. Like if um and let's see, for example, let's pick a sort of common name. Let's pick like um, Andrew or something like that. Oh, Andrew's a good one. Um, this because there's don't really care how it's like spelt. Matter more so how it's actually said. In Esperanto, this would be something along the lines of Andrew or something like that. Or you can probably do Andrew or Andro. Uh, however, it makes it um, more natural to you. Or Andrew, you know, however it makes it, yeah. Um, that's one way. Um, there is another way. There are some Esperanto names that are inherently in Esperanto. So, for example, somebody like John, that is, yeah, it's probably right. In Esperanto, we have the actual Esperanto name for that, Johanna. Um, there are very few of these. So, you're most likely not going to find them. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, I will add one thing to that. Um, as we covered, every noun ends in an O and every adjective ends in A, but when it comes to proper names, um, because these uh, gendered name endings are so prevalent throughout Europe, uh, when it comes to proper names, uh, folks have a, a tendency, or, or maybe a tolerance, I should say, for uh, a proper name ending in a ah. like you can consider that sufficiently uh, esperantized and you, and you can still treat that like a noun so you know maria if, that, if that's your name um turning that into mario is is obviously <laughs> that's that isn't right so you can say maria and you can still you know uh, ac accuse it advise it as you would um, and the fact that it's capitalized is is uh guidance enough <laughs> mm. there's yep there's that um there are two other things actually it's quite a bit um there are also direct translations that you can do um this is less recommended um because well it also depends on the person and really does depend on how intelligible you want it to be like for example like uh, an old testament name let's see let, let me look at the example real quick Old Testament name of David. David in Hebrew actually means beloved. Um, but you won't go around and seeing people translate that very often as Amata. You know, technically that would be what it would um, be translated as in Esperanto. And, um, it's, and it's funny to mention that because I think Amato is a beautiful last name, but I haven't seen anybody actually do that. So... <laughs> <laughs> And it's very pretty, very nice. Um, actually, um, Arabic actually has a very interesting name, Habib. Um, that is actually somebody, some people's first names. I have some more um, examples on the chalkboard as well, if anybody's still tuned into the stream. Uh, you know, here's my name. A literal translation would be like Code Texisto, because uh, to weave is like, you know, textiles, right? Um, but that's just, oh, I hate that, actually. Maybe, I, I've had people tell me that, that that's fine and that that looks cool to them, but that's just not me. I could spell it differently and, and just kind of keep the, the essence, but... Uh, that looks pretty bad too. A prominent Esperantist, uh, his name is 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 Jan Wesley. I, I assume that's Jan, based on how he Esperantized it. This is his official uh, Esperantized name that they he goes by. You know, he he elected this for himself, John Wesley. If it were me, I would have at least used the hat J Jean. But uh, that's not my call to make. It's his name, not mine. <laughs> and you also don't see this ever for like regular Esperanto words, you know, the letter wo at the beginning, but for proper names, again, you, you can get away with that, you know, we, we all know what that means, so. Mm -hmm. And let's see here, there's also one extra thing um, <laughs> that should be considered when you're uh, doing, when you're doing names or Esperantizing names. It is not about making it sound fancy, it is not making it, um, like sound foreign or it's not making it trying to sound Esperanto in, in per se. What you are trying to do is make it understandable as easy as possible to Esperanto speakers so that if say somebody speaks Chinese for example and has a Chinese name and goes by that Chinese name um, that 
you Esperantize that name as best as you can so that other Esperanto speakers will understand it. Um, that's the main purpose is um, intelligibility. It's not for direct translation. So because so, I know like for example Chinese names can get extremely complicated even though they're just only three characters or two characters. Um, but just making it so that other people can pronounce it in Esperanto is the ideal like goal of Esperanto sizing names. And something that follows from that, I just remembered, um, it's customary to capitalize the family name. And when I say customary, that's more of a, a formality. That's also a bit old school. Um, I noticed that informal contexts and, and with a younger crowd, we don't care as much about that. But um, so Jan, uh, John Wesley, again, as an example, Wesley would be capitalized. And, and the reason for doing that is in Japan, for example, the family name comes first uh, and the given name comes after. So you would you would capitalize the first name instead in case that uh, that distinction mattered. So that's a thing yeah. that is common in letters and things, but, uh, you know, yeah. it's, it's whatever. Yeah, so. and by capitalize, he means legit, like the whole, all the letters are capitalized, not just the first. Yeah, if, if you're not like still walking in for the, this in, um, like this. Go ahead. Like, uh, there you yeah. go. Like, this is actually a really common thing to do for Chinese speakers and Chinese and Japanese um, learners of Esperanto still. It's actually kind of uh, still there because um, the Western influence people misinterpreting, possibly. Yep. So that is it. I'm closing down the chalkboard. Awesome. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming today. And especially for staying after this long. I mean, I, you know, like, like I said, the, the class was two and a half hours. This all is extra. Um, I am still recording in case anybody wants to follow these questions, but uh, never want to deprive people of an opportunity to learn. So I hope you got your questions answered satisfactorily. And, you know, the rest of the day is yours, but uh, I hope to see you out there in Esperantuyo. <laughs> oh boy, yep. Alrighty, there we go. Class session. dismissed. <laughs>